Coming up next, the nation bids farewell to President Ronald Reagan. Presidential historian Robert Dalek will join me, along with Wolf Blitzer and Judy Wood. Stay with us. I haven't answered the phone in years. My kids tell me that Mid-Continent's calling features are so worth it, Dad. And my long-distance bills are low. I didn't know. Considering. I love that I get great telephone service from the same company that delivers my digital cable and high-speed internet. Well, at least the remote's all mine. Get hooked with Mid-Continent Communications, local and long-distance telephone. How hard is it to spot cable theft? A lot easier than some people apparently think. Take illegal hookups, for example. See this? It's a printout of all our customers. Now, see that? That's the actual hookup. All it takes is looking at that and looking at this. That wasn't hard, what? Unauthorized cable hookups are something we take very seriously. Call Mid-Continent Communications now and get hooked up legally. After year in America, more people choose Ford than any other make of vehicles. They choose America's most trusted SUV. They choose the powerful, smooth-riding, go-anywhere SUV. They choose the best-selling SUV in America, 13 years running. And now, get 0% financing for 60 months, plus 2,000 cash back when financed through Ford Credit. Make the right choice. Ask the experts at your Northland Ford dealer. Is there room in your house and your heart to give an abused or neglected kid a shot of happiness? They have a very tough childhood and they bring a lot of issues with them, but the rewards are enormous. Foster parents like Tim and Diane Meyer are desperately needed. And if you've got that ability to give them something, a whole love, anything, go for it. <laughs> Interested? Please contact the Children's Home Society for information. This tradition of caring message is brought to you by these sponsors. Former First Lady Nancy Reagan, a classic interview encore, Larry King, CNN 9 Eastern. A political defense of President Bush coming from an unlikely source, Russian President Vladimir Putin. Putin defended President Bush against criticism from Democrats over the war in Iraq. Putin, answering reporters' questions at the G8 summit in Sea Island, Georgia, said Democrats have, quote, no moral right to attack the president over Iraq, end quote. President Putin reminded reporters it was President Clinton who authorized the 1999 bombing of Yugoslavia by US, U.S. and NATO forces. Russia opposed both the Yugoslav bombing and, of course, the war in Iraq. Returning now to our top story, the nation's final farewell to President Ronald Reagan. Joining me now from Washington, CNN's Wolf Blitzer and Judy Woodruff, who have been leading our coverage. And in Washington, presidential historian Robert Dalek, the author of numerous books on presidents, including Ronald Reagan, The Politics of Symbolism. Uh, Bob, before uh, I bring in my colleagues who've done just such an outstanding job this week, let me ask you this. The essential question at the end of uh, this week of uh, mourning, this national day of mourning, is it uh, in your judgment, and I know it's early, but is it in your judgment, uh, too soon to say that uh, Ronald Reagan will go down as uh, one of the most important presidents? Well, Lou, I think there's no question he'll be remembered as one of the most significant presidents in the country's history, and particularly in the 20th century. You know, Lou, there have only been 12 presidents out of the 43 so far who had eight years or more in office. The more, of course, was FDR. And that's pretty pretty thin group or a pretty limited group to be a part of and so that alone makes him a, a, a major significant president and I think historians will be uh, looking at his records and studying his work and his administration his leadership for years and years to come you know we're only 15 years away from his presidency and uh, the bulk of his papers have not opened yet and so historians in the next 15 20 years are really going to dig in and barbers and historians are going to have uh, a field day, so to speak, and I think we're going to see an awful lot of books about Ronald Reagan's eight years in the presidency in the next uh, 15, 20 years. And Judy, I, I, would I, I would ask both you and Wolf, uh, as you have been reporting on uh, this uh, this week of mourning for our, our 40th president, 
to think back in your coverage of presidents, uh, to think, remember and recall your coverage of this uh, president, uh, Ronald Reagan. And, and give us your just your best sense. Uh, they say that uh, news is history's first draft. Uh, no offense, uh, <laughs> Robert Dalek. Uh, <laughs> One second. But in the, in the first draft, uh, your thoughts, your reactions, your personal thoughts. Judy? Well, it has just been an extraordinary week. I mean, uh, it has been, and this has been... He is in the presence in the next uh, 15, 20 years. And Judy, I, I, would, I, I would ask both you and Wolf, uh, as you have been reporting on uh, uh, this, uh, this week of mourning for our, our 40th president, to think back in your coverage of presidents, uh, to think, remember and recall your coverage of this uh, president, uh, Ronald Reagan. And give us your just your best sense. Uh, they say that uh, news is history's first draft. Uh, no offense, uh, <laughs> Robert Dalek. Uh, <laughs> One second. But in the in the first draft, uh, your thoughts, your reactions, your personal thoughts, Judy. Well, it has just been an extraordinary week. I mean, uh, it has been, and this has been said over and over again, it's the first time in uh, 30 years that we have uh, had a state funeral for a president, uh, where we've seen the sort of pomp and circumstance that we've had all week. You know, you had both the majesty of today's service at the National Cathedral here in Washington and uh, the very emotional, uh, if you will, the scene of the caisson coming down uh, Pennsylvania, uh, or rather Constitution Avenue on Wednesday, combined with the very personal scenes with Nancy Reagan. So it's brought together the state. Uh, the the uh, the pomp, but it's also brought the personal, uh, all in in one in in a six day period, and I think um, I think it's also been a time to bring Americans together. If only for a few days, it's it's brought us together. And one point I'd add, uh, Lou, is that uh, as much as these are icons and these are famous people, Ronald Reagan, of course, the president of the United States. What we saw also are that the, the, these are human beings who are left in the aftermath. Nancy Reagan, a, a wife who so deeply loved her husband now in mourning, uh, and, and the children, of course, in mourning as well. And others are human beings, like the former president, the first president, Bush. When he choked up today, as he was delivering that eulogy, and he became so sentimental about the man he served for eight years as vice president, that was just a human moment that all of us could appreciate. And Bob Dalek, uh, that's really part of the, uh, the motivation uh, for this pomp and circumstance, as Judy referred to it, uh, as the nation remembers uh, a president uh, uh, now uh, going to his final resting place in California. Uh, the nation attaches to the symbolism that you've spoken of in all of this. Yes. Well, you know, Reagan is a powerful, symbolic figure, most of all because, as Judy was saying, he's a unifying force. And I think uh, I've been saying there's been so much acrimony in our politics in recent years. You remember back to the election in 2000 and the now the current election campaign. Uh, it's, so, it's so divisive. And Reagan sort of inspired in spirits of the nation gives a feeling that uh, it has shared values and a, and a better future. A reminder that we can be united and, uh, and we appreciate uh, all of you being here. Uh, again, Judy Woodruff, uh, Wolf Blitzer, just outstanding uh, uh, work uh, this week. Uh, we thank you very much. And Robert Dalek, we thank you very much for your time and sharing your thoughts. Turning now to the results of our poll, only 4% of you responded that you have not decided uh, whom you will vote for in this presidential election. And the uh, undecided is narrowing significantly, at least among this audience, uh, this very demanding and intelligent audience of this broadcast. We thank you for voting. Still ahead, playing tribute to a friend, the special relationship between President Reagan and former President Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, and celebrating two men with the words and music both love. To the bank guy? Yeah. I said I want a free checking with no minimum balance, plus free online bill paying, plus I want lots of your ATMs so we don't have to worry about those fees. Because I don't think we should have to pay for any of it. <laughs> you know what he said? Goodbye. He said we don't think you should pay for it either. Oh. Free checking with no minimum balance, plus, 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 from Bank of America. Higher standards. Hi. We're doing a story on the finance and insurance industry. Excuse me.
Chief is there. What's your job? I'm an underwriter. What's your job? I'm an accountant. Underwriter. I am. Get a great PC, our 510T for an extraordinarily low price. It's one of our best-selling hyper-threading 510 series desktops, all of which come with a free three-month subscription to Napster, 20 free downloads, and free shipping for a limited time. The 510T's got a fast Intel Pentium 4 processor with HT technology and a CD burner. With Dad's free Napster subscription, he's ready to rock with music, power, and performance. Call Gateway today. <laughs> Here's what we're working on tonight for Newsnight. What the nearly 10,000 letters that Ronald Reagan wrote reveal on a special edition of Newsnight. CNN, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. President Reagan had a special relationship, both political and personal, with former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, the 78-year-old Lady Thatcher, in poor health after her stroke and against her doctor's wishes, flew from London to pay tribute and respects to her friend and compatriot in world leadership. Robin Oakley reports from London. Margaret Thatcher greeted the death of President Ronald Reagan by declaring he was one of her closest political allies and dearest oh, yes. personal friends. He was the only world leader she used to kiss, and theirs was likely the most long-lasting and effective world leaders alliance of the 1980s. The great communicator in the White House, and the woman dubbed the Iron Lady by a Soviet Army newspaper, saw the world in stark black and white, not in any intervening shade of grey. And really their thinking on many issues, not just the evils of communism, became very similar. Hatred of high taxes, hatred of big government, hatred of socialism in all its forms. The so-called special relationship was probably stronger with Thatcher in Downing Street and Reagan in the White House than it's been since the days of Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. It is how much we have in common and the depth of our friendship that truly matters. In her memoirs, which have 72 references to President Reagan in the index, she notes, I knew that I was talking to someone who instinctively thought and felt as I did. And they didn't always agree. It was Thatcher who first persuaded Reagan that the Soviet Union's Mikhail Gorbachev was a man they could do business with. But when the two presidents met at Reykjavik and President Reagan nearly agreed to surrender most of the West's arsenal of arms, she dashed off to Washington to lecture him on his imprudence. And observers say she was furious when in 1983 the US invaded the Caribbean state of Grenada, a member of the British Commonwealth, without first warning the UK. Thatcher's increasing suspicion of Europe increased her eagerness to work with President Reagan. I prefer the great alliance between the English-speaking peoples and America. It's that which saved liberty for the world. It was an alliance which worked for two leaders successfully seeking to rebuild optimism in their countries. Margaret Thatcher was always ready to pay tribute to America and to the leadership of a president she saw as having played a major part in the defeat of communism. You have in this century so often remained steadfast for what is right and against what is wrong. And it was the way in which the special relationship worked in their time, perhaps, which in the end brought round a Europe initially suspicious of a president who worked as a Hollywood actor to appreciate his contribution to history. Robin Oakley, CNN, London. This has been a week in which the nation's focus has been on remembrance of one of the greatest presidents of the past hundred years, Ronald Reagan. 
But we also lost another national treasure this week, Ray Charles. And tonight we leave you with a tribute to both men. Ray Charles performing America the Beautiful at President Reagan's second inaugural gala in 1985. I'm Anderson Cooper. A family mourns. The nation says a last goodbye to an American president. 360 starts now. At the National Cathedral, presidents, prime ministers, and princes said farewell to Ronald Reagan. Tonight we look at two special relationships he shared. One powerful with British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. One personal with his daughter Patty. Tonight, Ronald Reagan returns home. Special edition of Anderson Cooper 360. Good evening, thanks for joining us tonight. I went to Ronald Reagan's funeral today in Washington, not as a journalist or as a partisan. I went with my mom, a friend of Nancy Reagan's. When my brother died some 16 years ago, Mrs. Reagan came to his funeral. We rode in her car to the burial site. I remember the look on my mom's face that day, the stunned, far-off gaze, the silent sadness she wore like a cloak. I saw that face again today. This time it was Mrs. Reagan's. As she visited with her husband one more time, I think we all saw it on TV. You might have heard some people call today a day of closure. If you've ever lost a loved one, you know there is no such thing. Some have said the media has overcovered this story. A lot of your emails tell us just that, and perhaps you're right. Tonight, the wall-to-wall -wall coverage will come to a close. For Nancy Reagan and the family, of course, the grief does not end so quickly or so easily. If in a few moments Ronald Reagan will land in California today, he left Washington for the final time. Judy Woodruff was covering it for CNN. She joins me now. Judy, your particular Hi. moments today that stand out to you? Well, there were several. I mean, uh, again, Anderson, the, just the pomp and circumstance of it all, uh, the beauty, the simple elegance, uh, the flag draped casket, that moment that you just mentioned uh, of Mrs. Reagan uh, bending over the casket to touch it once again, the flag. But I think during the service itself, I was struck by the first President Bush, George H.W. Bush, combining humor with his remembering Ronald Reagan, the little story about, you know, remembering Bishop, meeting with Bishop 
Bishop Tutu and and uh, how was the meeting and he said President Reagan said so so I mean there were there were those touches and I think that was the humanity that we wanted to hear and we did get some of that today it was also striking to see all those dignitaries and and sort of the elite of Washington who had come out um, and yet, at the same time, I couldn't help it but feel, as I was sitting there in the cathedral, um, about all the other people who had come all week long uh, in California and Simi Valley, but also in Washington, standing on line, sometimes in 90 degree heat, uh, to see this man who, who they saw not only as their president, but in many cases as their friend. And Anderson, when I look back on the, this week of remembering Ronald Reagan, it's those people that you mentioned I'm going to remember. I'm going to remember the crowds that we saw standing in line uh, when you and I were out there last Monday uh, at the Reagan Library in Simi Valley, and I'm going to remember the crowds here in Washington. Um, that's the spontaneous outpouring of, of connection with this man. Today was an invited-only group, and yes, it was important, and it was formal, and, and so forth, and a lot of important people were there. But what really matters, it seems to me, in the last analysis is uh, how many ordinary Americans came out. And I think that uh, will be my memory as well. Judy Woodruff, thanks very much. Great coverage today. Thank you. Thanks. Let's uh, take a look at uh, this day. It was a difficult day, of course, for the Reagan family, a day that started early for Nancy Reagan. Early this morning, Nancy Reagan visited her husband as he lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda. Yet another very private moment of grief in very public view. Ronald Reagan's body was transported to the National Cathedral, where Washington's elite waited one last time to hail the chief. <laughs> President and Mrs. Bush were there, so were the four living ex-presidents foreign dignitaries, old friends like Margaret Thatcher of Great Britain and Mikhail Gorbachev, last leader of the nation Reagan once branded the evil empire. Front and center as she had been in his life, Nancy Reagan sat surrounded by family. Some speakers recall moments of humor. Outstep Nancy and Mila looking like a million bucks. And as they headed towards us, President Reagan beamed, he threw his arm around my shoulder, and he said with a grin, you know, Brian, for two Irishmen, we sure married up. Some were at times nearly overcome with emotion. As his vice president for eight years, I learned more from Ronald Reagan than from anyone I encountered in all my years of public life. Perhaps most memorable of all, a taped address by an ailing Margaret Thatcher. Her body weak, her words still stunningly strong. We have lost a great president, a great American, and a great man. And I have lost a dear friend. President Bush paid homage to a fellow Westerner. When the sun sets tonight off the coast of California, and we lay to rest our 40th president, a great American story will close. Ronald Reagan left Washington one final time, one final trip, back to California with his beloved Nancy, the 40th president of the United States, is nearly home. Well, one of the most famous quotes about Ronald Reagan's economic proposals was made in 1980 by then-candidate George Herbert Walker Bush. He called them voodoo economics. It says something about Ronald Reagan that despite that, he still chose Bush as his running mate. And a quarter century later, Bush's son, the current president, embraces many of those policies. As you've seen, both Bushes paid tribute today to Reagan, the past, and the president coming together.
to honor a political mentor and a friend. CNN senior White House correspondent John King reports. George Herbert Walker Bush entered the cathedral first, followed soon after by George W. Bush, the 41st and 43rd presidents of the United States, called on to eulogize another president who shaped them both. Ronald Reagan belongs to the ages now. But we preferred it when he belonged to us. That two men named Bush are in the exclusive Club of Presidents is as much a part of the Reagan legacy as tax cuts and fighting communism. Eight years as vice president propelled this Bush to the White House, and from that, the son inherited not only a household name, but invaluable contacts and experience. As he showed what a president should be, he also showed us what a man should be. A loyal vice president through fierce debates over taxes and Star Wars and more, recalling the gift of being partisan, absent the petty and the personal. And he fought hard for his beliefs, but he lived from conviction, but never made an adversary into an enemy. He was never mean-spirited. And in death, as in life, Mr. Reagan's jokes were designed to break the tension. When asked how did your visit go with Bishop Tutu, he replied, so-so. It was wonderful. The current president shares Mr. Reagan's belief that faith has a place in politics, and optimism too, though it was tempered on this day. We know, as he always said, that America's best days are ahead of us. But with Ronald Reagan's passing, some very fine days are behind us, and that is worth our tears. John King, CNN, The White House. After a series of strokes, former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was told by her doctors to curtail public speaking engagements. But she had made a promise to Ronald Reagan, a promise to speak at his memorial. Eighteen months ago, she taped a eulogy, and today Thatcher reminded us and America why they called her the Iron Lady. With the lever of American patriotism, he lifted up the world. And so today, the world, in Prague, in Budapest, in Warsaw, in Sofia, in Bucharest, in Kiev, and in Moscow itself. The world mourns the passing of the great liberator and echoes his prayer. God bless America. Lady Thatcher was not only an ideological soulmate of the 40th president, she was a close personal friend as well. Earlier this week, I spoke to the respected British journalist and author Harold Evans about Ronald Reagan's friendship with Lady Thatcher and his often complicated relationships with America's European allies. They came together, Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, and Ronald Reagan, before he was president and before she was prime minister. They had a few minutes meeting, it was supposed to be in London, but the meeting went on and on and on for probably about two hours because they did find this common bond that you mentioned between economic freedom and political freedom but also they liked each other. Now, she was very direct and very icy, not as warm as Ronald Reagan, but the bond was immense. And afterwards, uh, Reagan was saying to another Englishman, to an Englishman, you know, she could be prime minister. And the Englishman said, are you kidding? She's a woman. And Reagan said, I don't forget Queen Victoria, young man. And of course, the Englishman said, hey, you're absolutely right. And then later on, of course, their bond developed politically. We were always very grateful in England for Reagan's support during the Falklands War. That was a really important time. Let's talk about his, the way he was perceived throughout Europe, because there were some, especially early on in his presidency, who sort of made fun of him as a cowboy, as someone who wasn't really uh, in charge of all the, the subjects of the day, really on top of things. But that, that opinion seemed to change over time. What, what changed it? You're absolutely right. At the very beginning, when he became president, one of my better writers, Godfrey Hodgson, wrote a profile of him as governor saying he was a success. And nobody believed it. They thought we'd been taken for a ride. But actually, gradually, what impressed them, first of all, of course, his personal warmth was very important. But we gradually came to appreciate that his stand against the evil empire was right. Now, many, many people didn't believe that at first, and there was you hope for in when he tried to bring in Pershing missiles to get the Soviets. And it, but it was, it was a stance against communism that it wasn't just politics, it was very personal. He had a, a real hatred of, of the notion of communism, the whole concept. Yeah, but we liked but the, uh, the British, you know, Churchill and Roosevelt had a, a relationship, and I think the relationship between 
Thatcher and President Reagan was closer even than Churchill Roosevelt. And it was this stand against communism very much worried people at first. But over the course of his eight years, that perception changed fantastically. Sir Harold Everton, thanks very much to, for being on the program. Good Thank talk you to you. Thank you. Good night. Uh, Ronald Reagan is returning home. We anticipate him touching down in California shortly. We, of course, will bring that to you live. Our coverage is extensive tonight. Coming up next on 360, the final days and hours of Ronald Reagan's life, revealed by his daughter Patty in her own words. and is low in carbs. So few, in fact, it's easy to burn the carbs in one Bud Light. That's why we've created the mini treadmill 2010. Use your treadmill at home. <laughs> On the town. Even in the gym. And it stores conveniently away till you need to use it again. Order yours today. Fresh, smooth, real. Bud Light, it's all here. Get ready for the wives. Shavit Reeves, the Stepford Limes is a horror picture that'll have you screaming with laughter. It's full of surprises. The Stepford Limes, rated PG-13. The Wives arrive today. that no car can control the elements. But that didn't stop our engineers from designing one that actually embraces them. At CDW, we ship over 100,000 IT products to customers every day. So how can we do it even faster? One word, wormhole. I think it could really change things. It could take our shipping system to a whole new level. Now I just need to figure out the whole space-time continuum thing. For the top-brand IT products you need, when you need them, you can always expect more from CDW. picture from Point Lagoon, California, some of the uh, young Californians waiting for the return of Ronald Reagan to the state that, the state that made him both professionally and politically, and the state that he loved so much, and the state he will be buried in in just a few hours. During his White House years, Ronald Reagan liked to escape as often as he could to his ranch in Santa Barbara, California. When he did, he would first fly into where you just saw, Point Lagoon, the nearby naval base in Ventura County. Tonight, the plane carrying the former president's body will land. We anticipate it within the half hour scheduled touchdown about then, about an hour from the start of Ronald Reagan's final internment service. CNN's Thelma Gutierrez is, is standing by live at Point Magoo. Thelma? Yes, you're right, Anderson. Uh, the presidential aircraft is scheduled to land in about a half hour. On its way to Point Magoo, though, it will fly at low altitude over the library at Simi Valley, which will be the president's final resting place. Now, you can see a shot of a huge amount of people. There are thousands of people who have come here. Um, they are military people, local dignitaries, and eight sailors from the USS Reagan who will greet the procession also behind me on the flight line you can see a blue vehicle now this has a loading device on it which will move the casket from the aircraft to the hearse down below the military pallbearers will pass between two lines of color guards and then the marine band will play god bless america as the president receives a 21 gun salute then the motorcade will begin its journey to the reagan library anderson Thelma Gutierrez, thanks very much. Standing by live in Point Lagoon, as Thelma said, should be within the half hour. Of course, we will bring that to you live, as we will all developments tonight. The Reagan children, of course, didn't always have a close relationship with their parents.
but the family has come together during the former president's long battle with Alzheimer's. This morning, Patty Davis was close by her mother's side, as she has been all week. In this week's People magazine, Patty Davis writes about her father, his final days, and his long journey into darkness. And I quote, his hand is as pale as the blanket covering it, she writes, and sometimes his breath just stops as seconds pass by, and I wonder and hold my own breath. My father is dying, and it feels like I've never thought about it before, even though I've been living with the thought for a decade. That is just one of the excerpts from Patty Davis that is going to be in People Magazine this week. People Magazine senior editor Patrick Rogers joins me now. Patrick, thanks for being with us tonight. Um, it is an extraordinarily moving piece of writing, an extraordinary personal work as well. Um, this death was anticipated for a long time, and yet the grief it, it, is very real and very strong, and, and I think for Patty Davis, perhaps a little unexpected. I think that the, the family anticipated that there would be relief after these 10 years of, of watching President Reagan fade away into this disease. But when the moment arrived, absolutely, it was, they, were, they were heartbroken. The, the scene that Patty describes of her mother crying, and, and uh, it's, it, it was devastating. It, it's obviously been just an extraordinarily tough journey for them all. Um, and, and she has not had a, a close relationship over the years with, with, with Nancy Reagan by all published uh, accounts. But there's a, they really do seem to have come together lately. And let me show you one other thing that she wrote. She says, quote, My mother is, this, she calls this, by the way, a snapshot in waiting. My mother is tiny, her weight against me light. The back of her head is cupped in my hand, but her grief is huge and so heavy it pulls on the joints of my body. It will be okay, I tell her, but I have no idea if it will be. Why do you think she wanted to write this? Patty's always written about her family. If, if you recall, she, she wrote like a thinly veiled novel about the family, and she told me, because uh, I asked her this, like at this moment, you know, you, you have time to write, and she said, I, I write, that's what I do, that's how I, how I move through the world. So I think it's just part of what she's done all along. The article was written before he died, but also uh, there's some addendums part to it after he died. I want to right. read one other segment um, that she wrote about the last moment she shared really with her father. Quote, when his breathing told us this was it, he opened his eyes and looked straight at my mother, eyes that hadn't opened for days did, and they weren't chalky or vague, they were clear and blue and full of love, and they closed with his last breath. If a death can be lovely, his was. A remarkable moment. Absolutely. Patty told me that she had, she had even asked one of his nurses in advance, do you think, you know, a lot of people when they die, they do have a last moment of lucidity, do you think I might have that, the nurse, on duty that day, her father had just died, and she said, well, I had that for mine, and, but in your case, you're dealing with Alzheimer's, that's probably not going to happen, so this was completely unexpected. You talked to her last on Tuesday, that's right. how's she doing? Um, she seemed uh, sad, and, and, but completely composed. But and surprised also by the sort of outpouring of emotion. Absolutely, and taking a great deal of comfort from that. You, you might think, you know, if your father's the president, you're used to having, you know, a nation of people who admire him, but certainly at this moment, that meant a lot, it meant a lot to that family. But as she mentioned specifically, there was a moment of silence at Yankee Stadium that her mother was touched by that. It's a, it's a beautiful piece of work. Uh, Patrick Rogers from People, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Well, 316 next, we're going to go live to the Reagan Library in California, where they are preparing right now, as you see, for the burial of President Reagan.
Just call, click, or visit your local Home Depot store today for your very own personal beverage vendor. Then start keeping up to 64 cans or 32 bottles of your favorite beverages close to the action. Customize the logo panels with your favorite team. Set the lockout to say hands off, buddy. Get a two-minute warning before drinks run out. Order the Sky Base that holds snacks, too, because man does not live by carbonated beverages alone. The Home Depot has your Skybox vending machine by Maytag for only $4.99. Order right now, and you'll get a free $50 Home Depot gift card by mail-in rebate. So call, click, or visit your local Home Depot store today. We have one ready for you. The Home Depot. You can do it. We can help. Here's what we're working on tonight for Newsnight. What the nearly 10,000 letters that Ronald Reagan wrote reveal on a special edition of Newsnight. CNN, 10.30 p.m. Menards is your Father's Day gift headquarters. Choose from over 50 different Stanley hand tools on sale for less than $10 each. Like a graphite handle hammer, 25-foot lever lock tape, or ratcheting screwdriver on sale now. Get the most out of your power tools with help from Vermont American. Choose from over 150 different kinds of bits, blades, and accessories all on sale for 20% off. Plus, a Menards gift card is always a great gift idea. Money MLB Extra Innings is like having my own personal MLB control room. Through the power of digital cable, you can watch your favorite team play even if you don't live in the same area. Wherever the action is, I'm there. Call now to order MLB Extra Innings for just $169. I can channel surf around the league to track my fantasy players. To order MLB Extra Innings, call now. Get your game on with MLB Extra Innings on digital cable. More Americans watch CNN. More Americans trust CNN. You're looking at a live picture at the Reagan Presidential Library where friends and family mourners have begun to gather to await the arrival of President Ronald Reagan, one final journey home. The spot where he will be buried was chosen by Mr. Reagan and Mrs. Reagan before the Presidential Library opened in 1991. It's a hilltop site with panoramic views westward, the perfect spot, they say, to catch the fading light of day. The plane carrying the President's casket should be arriving in California in a matter of moments, then a motorcade will carry it to that final resting place atop the hill for burial at sunset. CNN's national correspondent, Frank Buckley, is there waiting at the Reagan Library. Frank? Anderson, and before the aircraft uh, bearing the uh, body of President Reagan uh, lands at Point Magoo, we are told just within the next few moments, we're expecting a low-altitude uh, flyover of the aircraft known as Air Force One when there's a sitting president aboard known as Special Air Mission 28000 today. It is expected to pass by at any moment and within sight of the library. Once the aircraft lands and everyone travels here by motorcade, and there will be a very choreographed ceremony for the final burial services that will include remembrances from the Reagan children. There will be military honors, including a 21-gun salute and a flyover of FA-18s from the U.S. Navy. Today their call signs are Gipper 1, 2, 3, and 4, and there will be music, including a lone bagpiper who will play Amazing Grace as the casket is taken to its final burial spot. Anderson? Should be a very mo moving moment, of course. Frank Buckley, thank you very much for that. Tonight we leave you with President Reagan's own last public words from a handwritten letter to the American people. It was written in 1994 after he learned he had Alzheimer's. My fellow Americans, he wrote, I have recently been told that I am one of the millions of Americans who will be afflicted with Alzheimer's disease. Upon learning this news, Nancy and I had to decide whether as private citizens we would keep this a private matter or whether we would make this news known in a public way. In the past, Nancy suffered from breast cancer and I had my cancer surgeries. We found through our open disclosures we were able to raise public awareness. We were happy that as a result many more people underwent testing. They were treated in early stages and able to return to normal healthy lives. So now we feel it is important to share it with you. In opening our hearts we hope this might promote greater awareness of this condition. Perhaps it will encourage a clearer understanding of the individuals and families who are affected by it. At the moment, I feel just fine. I intend to live the remainder of the years God gives me on this earth, doing the things I have always done. I will continue to share life's journey with my beloved Nancy and my family. 
I plan to enjoy the great outdoors and stay in touch with my friends and supporters. Unfortunately, as Alzheimer's disease progresses, the family often bears a heavy burden. I only wish there was some way I could spare Nancy from this painful experience. When the time comes, I'm confident that with your help, she will face it with faith and courage. In closing, let me thank you, the American people, for giving me the great honor of allowing me to serve as your president. When the Lord calls me home, whenever that day may be, I will leave with the greatest love for this country of ours and eternal optimism for its future. I now begin the journey that will lead me into the sunset of my life. I know that for America, there will always be a bright dawn ahead. Thank you, my friends. May God always bless you. Sincerely, Ronald Reagan. You see the plane carrying the casket of Ronald Reagan to California. I'm Anderson Cooper. Up next, our special coverage of Ronald Reagan's funeral continues with Wolf Blitzer and Paula Zahn. Joe's cholesterol was high. He was told, get it low, so decided to move to the land of no. No snacking, no slacking, avoid all the bad. He ate right and ran every chance that he had. That was how he should start, the right way to go, and that many need more help to get bad cholesterol low. It's okay, said his doctor, add Crestor, you should. With diet and Crestor, you very well could cut bad cholesterol about half while raising the good. Would you like to try it? Why, yes, yes, I would. Ask your doctor about Crestor. Crestor is not for everyone, including people with liver disease and women who are nursing or pregnant who may become pregnant. A simple blood tests are needed to check for liver problems. Tell your doctor about other medications you are taking. Or if you experience muscle pain or weakness, or there may be a sign of serious side effects. Thanks to diet and Crestor, Joe's cholesterol's down. And the word spread across every village and town. It's the land of success. Crestor helps him stay there. And all his friends say, now you're getting somewhere. the people have had a national love affair with TV. Cowboys and cops, news and sports, sitcoms and soaps. Now, SBC customers can get it all from us. First the telephone, now home satellite television. Let us inform, enlighten, amuse, and entertain you. SBC, going beyond the call. When you're passionate about something, you never quit. Your multivitamin, Centrum Silver with Lycopene, an ingredient in tomatoes that science suggests may help reduce the risk of heart disease. Put your heart into what you love. Centrum Silver with Lycopene. special presentation. A final farewell to Ronald Reagan. Reporting from Washington, Wolf Blitzer and Paula Zahn. Good evening and welcome. Thanks so much for joining us for our special coverage of the nation's final farewell to President Ronald Reagan. What we're seeing now is the presidential jet bringing the coffin, the casket of President Reagan to uh, the uh, Point Magoo Naval Air Station not far from the presidential library. It's about to fly over, if it hasn't yet, fly over the Presidential Library in Simi Valley. We just saw it continue to uh, make that symbolic gesture over this library, the flags flying Paula at half staff. This is where the 40th President of the United States will be buried at sunset tonight on the Pacific. And the feeling of that ceremony, which we'll see unfold in about an hour and a half from now, will be much different in feeling from the grandeur of what we witnessed at the National Cathedral a little bit earlier today. Let's go to Candy Crowley, who's standing by at the Reagan Presidential Library right now to fill us in on what the tone of that service will be like. Hi, Candy. <laughs> Paula, I don't know if you can hear me at this point. We have a lot of, there are a lot of people here and a lot of static uh, in our earplugs in which we use it to, uh, to listen to you. But let me kind of set the scene for you. Um, this will be um, very close friends 
of the Reagans, as well as a lot of old Hollywood friends. Uh, we have seen uh, Kirk Douglas's name on the list of those expected. Uh, Merv Griffin, obviously. We've also seen uh, people like Pat Sajak, the, the game show host, uh, Charlton Heston. Uh, we have so far spotted uh, Tom Selleck is here. Uh, Wayne Gretzky, the hockey player, is here, but also close friends, names like Blooming, uh, Bloomingdale and uh, Annenberg, uh, longtime friends of the Reagans, they will be here. Uh, this is a much more intimate setting than what we saw today uh, at the National Cathedral, but there will still be uh, a number of uh, flourishes befitting a president. A 21 gun salute, there'll be a flyover of F 18s. Uh, so there still will be those sorts of things, but the feel here is uh, very much more one of, of family and old friends, uh, whereas in Washington it was sort of a salute to a president, a salute to the leader of the free world. Um, this is a goodbye to a father, this is a goodbye to a husband, and a goodbye to a friend. In fact, we will hear for the first time uh, since their father's death uh, from the three surviving Reagan children, uh, Patty, Michael, and Ron, so they're expected to make some comments here. Uh, as well. The burial, I don't know uh, how much you've seen of this. This is the most gorgeous spot. Um, the president had said he wanted uh, a sundown ceremony. He will get it. The sun has been shining in the bluest of skies all day long. Um, as I am looking sort of into the camera, uh, right behind where the camera is, is where uh, the president will be laid to rest uh, in uh, a sort of a curved um, the setting where he is looking directly west. This is a man, of course, who came from Illinois and headed west to find his fame and fortune. And there was that little eight, uh, eight years in Washington, but uh, this was where his heart is. This is where he will be buried, and as requested, he will be facing west. Paul and Walt? I guess when you look back, thank you, Candy, on what unfolded here in Washington. Uh, the skies were very gray and ugly, and there's something, uh, I guess, appropriate about uh, those people attending the service later today to be able to see a California sunset, the sunset that this president was so drawn to. Appropriately enough, Paul, a beautiful day in California. What we're seeing now is this U.S. Air Force presidential jet carrying the casket of Ronald Reagan to Point Magoo, the Naval Air Station in California, not far from the presidential, or excuse me, library. This is a plane that has uh, undertaken this approximately five-hour flight that left earlier today from Andrews Air Force Base. A uh, flight that's about an hour faster than most people usually travel on a co commercial flight. On board the flight, besides some of the family members, um, or on board is Margaret Thatcher, who delivered a magnificent eulogy early today, talked in very personal terms about her friendship with the president, talked about the president's optimism and his greatest gift being to be able to cheer us all up. There was some concern she wouldn't be able to make this trip. She has suffered a series of mild strokes, and she, in fact, pre-recorded the eulogy, and we saw that play out on videotape today. And her doctors recently had not allowed her to give any speeches or travel at all. So it's quite remarkable that as frail as she is, that it was very important for her to show up in Washington today and get on this plane and fly cross-country. And speaking of frail, Paula, perhaps most important aboard this aircraft is Nancy Reagan, who has gone through these past several days with such dignity, such charm, such poise. I suspect, though, as we get closer to this final, final event in this nearly week-long period of national mourning here in the United States, it will become increasingly more difficult in the next few hours. This is the plane that will touch down momentarily at Point Magoo at the Naval Air Station. We'll watch it land. Sienna Stelma Gutierrez is over there already watching this land as well. Stelma, uh, tell us. What, the, what, what we can anticipate once the plane taxis to a stop, the casket is removed, and the, and the former first lady emerges. Yes, Wolf, in fact, uh, we see that uh, that SAM 28000 has approached Point Magoo. In fact, we believe that it has landed. We can hear it off in the distance right now as it pulls over onto the flight line here at Point Magoo. We're told, Wolf, that once... It has, has now landed. We're seeing it live. It has touched down on the runway at Point Magoo, and it's obviously going to taxi for a while before it stops. But what will happen uh, immediately uh, as it stops and the, the, the people aboard this plane begin to emerge and the casket is removed? Well, exactly what will happen is that there is a, a vehicle here which has a loading device to move the casket from the aircraft 
to the presidential hearse, which is waiting here on the flight line. There, there will be military pallbearers, which will pass between two lines of color guard, and then a Marine band will begin to play God Bless America. The president will receive a 21-gun salute by four howitzers that are out here in, uh, on, in the distance from the flight line. Then the motorcade will begin its journey to the Reagan Library, but not before Wolf. Everyone is seated, particularly Nancy Reagan, and I wanted to mention that uh, it really is an amazing sight out here. There are thousands of people. We were here early today, just a, a, a few military folks. Now there are thousands that are lining this area. You see sailors from the USS Reagan who are here. There are eight of them which were chosen to be here. Uh, they are going to be joined by local dignitaries who will greet the procession. And then you see many children out here, military children holding flags, waving flags. You also see uh, Secret Service. The security here is incredibly tight. They've made several sweeps through the area throughout the day. And uh, just an amazing sight. Many, many people waiting to greet the First Lady and the procession. Thelma, what has been striking to Wolf and me over the last several days is to hear the number of young people, who many of whom weren't even born when Ronald Reagan was serving as the president, who felt the need to in some, pay, uh, some way pay their respects to the president, either at the library or perhaps even out at the Naval Air Station today. Yeah, that's exactly right. In fact, uh, I spoke with many children. I asked them, do you know who President Reagan is? Do you know who he was, what he stood for? And oddly enough, they had talked to their parents and they, they said, you know, I wasn't around when he was president, but they told me that he was a good president and uh, that's why I'm here. Tom, so stand by. Uh, we're going to be getting back to you. Our senior analyst, Jeff Greenfield, is watching all of this uh, together with all of us. Jeff, just if you think about it in historic terms, to take this casket from the nation's capital in Washington and bring it back to California, a flight of approximately a little bit more than five hours. Uh, earlier presidents who went through these state funerals, sometimes it took days, in fact weeks, to get their caskets back to their final resting grounds. Well, the most particular one was the body of Abraham Lincoln, um, who went on train uh, from Washington up to New York, through Buffalo, and it took, it took all in all more than 16 days. The, they don't even know how many people saw it because at every big city they would take the casket and they would have a ceremony in, at a city hall. They would have a kind of a parade is perhaps the wrong word. And that Lincoln funeral train was one of the most searing moments of post-Civil War America. There were literally a couple of million people who, who remember that as one of the great moments, one of the most important moments of their, of their lives. And, and this is obviously a, a very different circumstance in every way, not the least of which is that Ronald Reagan presided for eight years. He hasn't been president for 15 years. I was talking with uh, one of his old friends and supporters, William F. Buckley. I happened to be riding up to New York with him on the train. And he was just amazed that 15 years after Reagan had left office, 10 years after he really left us with Alzheimer's, the, the power, the meaning of his death, uh, the need to recognize it, really speaks something to the consequentiality of Ronald Reagan, who, I mean, I, you, we can argue politics all you want or policies. I will say it again. This is the most consequential political figure in the White House since Franklin D. Roosevelt, and that's one of the reasons why so many thousands of people turned out and why we have been covering this almost nonstop for a week. Well, you know, Jeff, uh, as we see this plane continue to taxi and the crowds that have gathered at the Point Magoo Naval Air Station in California getting ready to glimpse, have a little glimpse at this historic moment, uh, uh, set the stage what we should be looking for later tonight at sunset Pacific time, California time, when the final event of this week-long period of national mourning occurs. I have a feeling that that is going to be one of the more emotional moments of this whole week. Um, I, 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 I sort of said for several days that I, I, don't, I don't know that people really feel a sense of loss because he had a full life. He was the oldest ex-president. He died peacefully after a battle with Alzheimer's. But there's something about a burial at sunset that marks a finality that I think mean, even for those of us who have looked at this more like a commemoration or a celebration, that is the last possible final farewell. That is the last time Nancy Reagan, who has been having very emotional moments each time she approaches the casket and then leaves it, this will be the very last one. And so I think uh, even for those of us who see this as a, a commemoration, 
that's where the emotional punch may well come as the sun sets and, and the president is laid to rest. Well, Thanks so much. Uh, Jeff, let's check in now with James Kuhn, who was an executive assistant to the president during his presidency. We have been riveted by Nancy Reagan over the last five, six days, her composure, her dignity, her grace. Today, I was almost tortured watching her, particularly as she reached down, bent over to kiss the casket, and at one point it almost appeared as though she was saying something to the casket. You knew them both for many, many years. How do you react to those pictures that we've seen? Well, I Paul, I think she probably was talking to him. In fact, I'm sure she was. And uh, you know, as I look at the footage here of, of 28,000 uh, pulling up with Mrs. Reagan and President Reagan's body on board, I'm thinking what must be going through her mind and my sense is that, uh, that there has to be somewhat of a, a state of peace of mind right now that, that she's feeling because I know one of her concerns over the past few years has been that something could possibly happen to her and that she wouldn't be here to be with Ronnie to make sure that he had the care that, that she wanted him to have until the final day. That was very important to her. The right doctors, the right support personnel, and she watched that very closely. And she wanted to ensure that she was here until he was gone. So there has to be some peace of mind there that that, that worked out for Although a number of her friends have been quoted as saying that it has been very difficult for her to even think about letting go over the last several days, although she's had a decade to prepare for this possibility, one can only imagine maybe what a state of shock this she's still in. I saw that on Monday when she uh, was at the library and leaned over the casket, and it hit me very hard then, the impact that, that that no matter how long you prepare for this and uh, what goes through your mind, the pain and suffering that she was feeling at that time it hit me very hard. I, I noticed you said that it was so important for her personally, Jim, to be around at this time of national mourning. Uh, and this was so important for her to say goodbye to Ronnie, as she called him. You told me uh, a few days ago that one of the things you learned from her was how to eat in really, really small portions amazing when people talk about how frail she looks today. I thought uh, she was a tower of strength when I saw her today at the National Cathedral. She looked fantastic. She looked strong. She looked the way that President Reagan wanted her to look today. And uh, But more specifically, I, she amazed me as First Lady when we would travel around the country overseas in hotel suites. She would, uh, her portion of food would be 10% of what a normal human being would get. Yes. It's being uh, and she would eat about 5% of that. And uh, I learned from Nancy Reagan that you don't have to eat a lot to survive. And uh, but, uh, yet a very strong woman. Very disciplined woman. Yes. And that discipline certainly is coming through this week. Uh, how much of this event, these past several days, did she personally coordinate? Well, she has overseen this from the very beginning. As they planned the funeral years ago, uh, Nancy's, uh, Nancy Reagan's touch has been on everything, a touch of elegance from beginning to end. So she, she looked at this very carefully and, uh, and she had a major role in it at the outset. It is so interesting to compare and contrast her image today with her image when she was First Lady. And we all recognize that every First Lady has been a lightning rod at some point of her husband's presidency. Uh, but this is someone who, it, it, it strikes me, whose reputation has been completely changed by this very long journey she's had to travel with her husband. I think so too, but yet it was unfair as First Lady. She had the reputation and, and you know, various uh, connotations or nicknames or whatever that were negative. But uh, Paul, it was never because of Nancy Reagan. If she had to speak up, if she had to get on the phone with the Chief of Staff or uh, myself or anybody and things were going right, it was always because of her roommate or Ronnie, it was never because of herself. And I have to tell you, whenever I got a phone call, uh, it was never because we, we you know, had done a good thing, our work perfectly. We usually had missed something or the president was not served well and it was pointed out and we corrected it. She's doing her job. When's the last time you had an opportunity to talk with Nancy Reagan? I saw her in March, uh, late March, and spent an hour with her. Uh, in their home, 
President Reagan was there. I didn't see him, of course. Uh, but you felt his presence while we spoke. How so? You just had this sense that he was looking over his shoulder, the strength of Ronald Reagan, and we were with his beloved Nancy. And we had a delightful discussion about Washington, uh, about stem cell research. We talked a lot about Ronald Reagan, uh, about all of his achievements, about the personal side of him. It was a delightful hour. Let me explain to our viewers, uh, Jim, Paula, what we're seeing right now. The crowds have gathered at the Point Magoo Naval Air Station, not far from the Reagan Presidential Library in Simi Valley in Southern California. People have come with their children, a lot of young kids here. The uh, front of the plane uh, will be uh, where the former First Lady will exit. She'll walk down the stairs together with her children and other guests who have made this trans, uh, who have made this flight across the country from Andrews Air Force Base outside Washington, D.C. They will walk down, they'll be received there. There will be a brief service ceremony here to the rear of the plane, and the belly of the plane. A truck is already pulled up. That will bring the casket down, uh, and then uh, the color guard will eventually move that casket over to a hearse for the journey, for the drive over from, uh, from Point Magoo, the Naval Air Station here, over to the Presidential Library you see the family minister showing up with the military, and Nancy Reagan Paula will be walking down those stairs shortly. She'll be escorted, I want our viewers to remember this, U.S. Uh, Major General Galen Jack Jackman, who's been with her since Sunday. She will walk down, he will, she will walk down those stairs escorted by the military escort officer who has been at her side virtually every minute since this ordeal began. I can't even imagine the stories he might have to share someday about the experience of having her lean on him. I'm sure he's provided a great deal of comfort to her. He had a big role. He had no question about it. When I see this footage also, I think of the uh, library and how President Reagan used to refer to it. He called it his museum. He didn't call it a library. He didn't call it a presidential library. He'd say, well, this will go in the museum or we'll do that at the museum. And, and, you know, it also makes you reflect, too, when they made the decision where their final resting place would be. It was the day of the groundbreaking, November 21st of 1988, when they had the ceremonial groundbreaking at the library, that they decided then on the trip down, driving down the, uh, the small mountain, the hilltop, that that would be their final resting place. And the minister we see at this, uh, at this uh, arrival ceremony is the Reverend Michael Wenning. He's a close personal friend of the family. Yeah, I do not know him, but uh, he has a major role there today, and you can see how important he was at the beginning of the week uh, for the footage and the photos of Mrs. Reagan in the casket and how he provided support that she needed at that time very much so. We so often hear living presidents when questioned about their legacy say, I'll leave it up to the historians to define that. In any of your conversations with the president after he left office, did he ever tell you what he hoped his legacy would be as seen through the history books? You know, he did not. He was so low-key about that. And I'll give an example of his, his unassuming nature. Uh, my family and I, we were in San Francisco. We drove down to see him at the ranch uh, early one evening. Shortly after, he gave one of his last great speeches at the Republican National Convention in Houston in 1992, which was just magnificent. And we were praising him, Nancy and I, and my wife and I were praising him over the great speech that he gave, and he was sitting in the chair, blushing over that praise, and couldn't, didn't have a response, couldn't say a word, just very shy, and uh, we were embarrassing him. But no, it, it, that wasn't wrong with him. He could not talk about it. We're going to take a pause now and listen to the ceremony as it unfolds.
Reagan in, uh, holding the arm of Major General Galen Jackman uh, in the United States military. He's not simply a military protocol officer or an escort, or an escort officer. He's a warrior. This is a soldier who served in, a, in an elite special operations commando unit, has seen his time in battle. But over these past several days, almost since Sunday, his mission has been simply this to do whatever he can to make Mrs. Reagan's life a little bit easier. Honey, she got off the plane just now. She repeated the scene that we saw as she left Andrews Air Force Base, where she took the time to wave to the crowd. At Andrews Air Force Base, in fact, she blew a kiss to the crowd. Uh, she's now taking that opportunity, an opportunity she did not have earlier in the week, particularly as the procession made its way to the rotunda when people screamed out loud. The only thing breaking the silence was, we love you, Nancy Reagan. And she's followed uh, up down those stairs, Mrs. Reagan, by her friend, Margaret Thatcher, who, as we all know, has not been in the best of health over these past several months, had a series of minor strokes, but she did insist not only on coming to the United States, Paula, and, and enduring this transatlantic flight, but also insisted on joining Mrs. Reagan to fly back to California. What a gesture. It's a wonderful gesture of friendship, and uh, she talked a lot about the roots of their friendship during her eulogy today, and she used some beautiful language describing Ronald Reagan and his convictions, and uh, talked about the enormous impact she felt he had in bringing the Cold War to an end.
several different efforts underway, one by the U.S. military, one by the state of California, to share with the Reagan family much of what is being said around the country right now. The U.S. military is going to gather some of Tolinson's books, not only collected here in Washington today from all over the country, and in the state of California, certain places, they are handing out blank pieces of white paper, eight and a half by 11, and asking the state citizens to fill them out. And it's quite remarkable what some people have said. Uh, one man uh, named Gio said, a great man that made possible a future for many immigrants to become U.S. citizens. In San Jose, someone wrote that the former president was a, uh, a, a, a man, a, a no American president ever did more to bring back pride to the people and the American military. And one would imagine, Jim Cohn, that that would be something that would be extremely comforting to Nancy Reagan down the road when she finally has the opportunity to absorb the enormity of what she's been through over the last six days. This will mean a lot to her, knowing that she has the support and that uh, President Reagan, at the end, had this kind of support, this outpouring of, uh, of the sorrow that people have shown and yet the upbeat side that they have conveyed uh, throughout this week, that's something that, uh, that will never leave her mind very, very significant, significant to her. This is the motorcade that will bring uh, the uh, casket to the Presidential Library in Simi Valley, the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. There is the hearse with the casket inside. It will be followed by the limousine carrying Nancy Reagan. Uh, our Larry King is already over at the Presidential Library. Larry, uh, give our viewers a sense of what you see and what you know is about to happen there. Well, thank you, Wolf. We've been here for a number of hours. My wife and I came early because uh, we were invited as well to the ceremony that will take place inside. Of course, duty calls, so I'll be out here. But my wife is in there. There was a wonderful reception, a tour of the library. About 700 guests. These are mostly Californians. Some flew in from nearby Oregon and Seattle and the like, but mostly California. A lot of movie people here. A lot of old, these are old Ronald Reagan, Nancy Reagan friends. And the mood is... Uh, in a way, celebratory. It was a great life. They appreciated his friendship. There's not a great deal of sadness here. There certainly doesn't appear any sign of mourning. They're all praising their friend Nancy, as she deservedly deserves that praise. This is a beautiful spot, Wolf. I don't know if you've been here. I imagine you have, or Paula. To the northwest of downtown Los Angeles, a gorgeous California day. Ronald Reagan picked out this site because he shot many Western films here in the Simi Valley area, and when you drive in, you can see how easily Westerns could have been shot here. They're going on military time today. They're expecting to start this thing right on time. We'll be anchoring it and talking to some guests. We'll be talking more to you as the hour progresses. And uh, it's a fitting end to an incredible week. Well, Paula. Larry, uh, all of our viewers know that you've been over these many years close to the Reagan family, especially Nancy Reagan. Give us your sense, Larry, how you think she's holding up based on what you've seen and heard. Well, I'm amazed. Nancy's going to be 82 years old. I know she's a strong lady, but she's strong in heart. She's not strong of body. Nancy Reagan is frail. She's very, very lightweight. She uh, needs help and assistance in walking. She is not a youngster. But she is in her heart spry as ever. And we are all amazed at how well she has stood up in this trying week. Now, being honest, he's been sick a long time, 10 years. This is not what we would call a greatly unexpected event. Yet, death is death. Parting is parting. Loss is loss. And she has had to put up with that, plus travel back and forth, facing the public, dignitaries, people coming from here and there, people asking her about stem cell research. And I'm confident she's going to get very involved in that battle as the days go on ahead. But we are extraordinarily impressed. Anybody who watches this and is not impressed with Nancy Reagan is not living on the planet. She's been extraordinary. I think you got that right. Uh, Larry, if you would, compare and contrast with, uh, for us, what we saw early today at the National Cathedral. This uh, absolutely glorious service where we heard world leaders speak. Margaret Thatcher eulogizing the former president, the former Prime Minister of Canada, and then the former President Bush and, and the current President Bush talking about uh, broad sweeping international ideas and more importantly I think the common thread that ran through all those eulogies was the notion that this was a very optimistic man at his core and was born to inspire. Tonight 
uh, describe to us what you think we might hear because the service will be so much more personal in that you will be hearing remembrances from Ronald Reagan's children. Right, it'll be more solemn. There'll be a long prayer service. There will be, except for the remembrances of the children, no speeches that I can see on the list. There'll be some wonderful music provided by two uh, Air Force Band and the Navy Band. Uh, there'll be a, a fitting ending. This will not be pomp and circumstance. It's not going to be all the... Um, well, the, the show that was put on this morning was incredible, I think. Watching it from a television standpoint, I think they did a magnificent job. This will be a little different, but we will have a 21-gun salute. We will have caps played at the end. It'll be solemn. It'll be like when anyway, if you go to a funeral of a friend or a neighbor and you attend the service, the service is one thing, the burial is another. It will not nearly be as long. I think this will run tops one hour once it starts. Yeah, I would put the mood as solemn and celebratory at the same time. This will be a grand send-off. And Larry King, of course, will be there every step of the way. Larry, stand by uh, for a moment as we see this motorcade begin to leave the Naval Air Station at Point Magoo, make its way over to where you are at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. Already inside is our Candy Crowley. She's there as well. Candy, uh, give us a little bit of the flavor from your vantage point. Well, I'm inside looking uh, north um, out into the valley. This is this is one gorgeous day and has been all along. I'd say there are maybe um, two, you know, a third full, maybe a little more than that. Uh, people have been kind of coming in. Um, we've got about an hour before the program gets underway, so we've been sort of trying to celebrity uh, spot here. Uh, we've seen Wayne Newton. We've seen uh, a, a number of people in the movie industry. Um, it's, uh, I, I think it's as Larry describes it. This is not a, 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 a somber occasion, but this is not a, a, a weeping crowd. This is more a salute. You know, I was looking at those kids in the, in the pictures that are waving the flags out at Point Magoo, and if you didn't know what it was, it looks like the beginning of a rally. So this is sort of a, a, a mix here. Um, they're starting to sing uh, some of the songs that will uh, come uh, throughout this ceremony. And uh, as Paula pointed out, the main, uh, the main speakers here will be the three children. So this is a very personal uh, time for the Reagans and a, a time to bring in uh, those that have known Ronald Reagan since the very beginning, well before uh, the governorship, uh, well before even uh, he took over the, the union, was union president. So. Um, these are old friends uh, coming to say goodbye, not in a weepy sort of way, a solemn way, yes, but uh, remember many of them, and a couple of them I talked to, haven't seen Ronald Reagan in, in 10 years, really. Uh, so uh, they had lost him and lost his closeness, and this is sort of the, the, the real end to it. So uh, they've had 10, 10 long years to be without him. Candy, thanks so much. Let's bring Jeff Greenfield back into the discussion. Jeff, I know the tone of the ceremony that is about to unfold comes as no surprise to you. You have talked a lot this week about how not only was Ronald Reagan the oldest man ever elected to be president, but this is a man who had been out of office for some 15 years, and the American public was very much in touch with his almost decade-long battle with Alzheimer's. And you said this probably should be viewed as more of, the, the whole week's activities as more of a commemoration than anything else. Yeah, I think when Larry King described it as more of a celebration, that, that just is fitting. Uh, the other part that this reminds us of is that, you know, we never really know which presidents are going to be consequential and which will not. I mean, every time there's an election, we always hear the same chant. How in a, two, in a nation this big can we come up with these two guys? Is this any way to elect a president? Whatever happened to great presidents? A hundred years ago, a British... Uh, scholar wrote, why great men are no longer chosen president. That was before Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt. Well, we had that same reaction back in 1980. My Lord, Carter and Reagan, I mean, is that the best we can do? What happened to the Giants? And now, from the perspective of 15 years later, again, we're going to have a lot of arguments about the policies that he implemented, but there is no question that Ronald Reagan was, in a political sense, a giant. I'll say it again, I think, the most consequential president since FDR. And it should remind us, as we judge 
the, 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 the people who are running for high office now, we don't know what history is going to say about these people. We don't know whether from the vantage of time we're going to look back and say, you know, that president accomplished some really interesting things. He really changed the country. He changed our politics. In the case of Reagan and the Cold War, along with Margaret Thatcher and Mikhail Gorbachev and Lech Wałęsa and a whole lot of other anonymous people, they literally changed the political face of the planet. Well, maybe that should be a lesson, uh, Paula and Wolf, and I'm talking to myself now, that as we look at this campaign ahead, we shouldn't be quite so quick to assume we know the dimensions of the people who are going to choose to lead us. History has some very interesting lessons about that. Paula. We will shy away from any questions that ever lead you in that direction, uh, Jeff yeah. Greenfield. Jim Coon, just a quick reflection on what we have seen since the plane has landed with President Casket. Well, I wanted to comment first on Jeff's uh, commentary about uh, Ronald Reagan and uh, being consequential and you know, at the end of the second term uh, when he would go off the cuff and would comment about the achievements that were made during his administration, creation of 23 million new jobs, uh, inflation well under control, interest rates low, uh, a lot of unnecessary regulations eliminated, he'd stand behind the podium before the cameras in front of a large audience and say that we didn't do it. We just got the heck out of the way. The American people did it. Ronald Reagan's, you know, classic way of never taking credit for anything. He's a very humble man. Vintage Ronald Reagan, and indeed, as all of us remember, uh, Jim Standby. Larry King is over at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. I'm fascinated, Larry, by a point that you made earlier that if the service at the National Cathedral here in Washington earlier today was a celebration of Ronald Reagan's eight years as president of the United States. The service that's about to take place where you are will be a celebration of his earlier life, including those days in Hollywood. Talk a little bit about that. Ronald Reagan was a very popular American figure long before he entered politics. Well, he was not a, what you would call a superstar. He was a rung below. His films were generally successful. He turned down the role in Casablanca, which eventually went to Humphrey Bogart. There's a funny story. When Lou Wasserman and Sonny Werblin both have gone now, were his agents. Uh, they were his agents throughout his career. When Ronald Reagan was elected, at his inaugural, there was a receiving line at a big party. When Lou Wasserman and Sonny Werblin walked up to him, he said to them, if you guys were better agents, I wouldn't have this job. That's the kind of stories that people are telling here at the reception. Stories of Ronald Reagan as an actor, as a broadcaster back in Illinois. And then the service that you're going to see will begin, if it begins properly, and military guys usually begin properly, it will start right at 9 o'clock Eastern. They'll be hailed to the chief. By the way, the first living president to be honored with that was Andrew Jackson in 1829. There'll be an invocation, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, words of remembrance from the children, we have a statement from Jane Wyman, Ronald Reagan's first wife, who said that he was a great, kind, and gentle man, and that America has lost a great president. The Reverend John Danforth, the former senator, will also be tapped to recite the Lord is my shepherd, the reading of the 23rd Psalm. There'll be ruffles and flourishes, the national anthem, the hymn, my country, tis of thee, the witness from the Ephesicant, the 21-gun salute, the benediction, a three volley of musketry, and taps. That's the program coming ahead. And Larry, you're going to walk us through every step of that program, uh, starting at the top of the hour, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, Larry, stand by. Uh, Paula wants to bring in one of our reporters along the motorcade. Yeah, we're just beginning to get a sense for some of these pictures, how many people have gathered along this procession route uh, to pay their respects to Ronald Reagan. Let's check in with Miguel Marquez, who has been out there most of the afternoon as these lines began to develop. Miguel, share with us what yeah, you've Colin, seen. California's Department of Public Safety believes that uh, you know tens of thousands of people will show up. They say that they're Estimates run as high as 300,000, between 100,000 and 300,000 people will line the route. It's 29 miles. It'll take about 45 minutes for that car, uh, the curse carrying the, uh, the, uh, the body of President Reagan to make its way up to the library. Uh, there are mostly Republicans out here that we have found. And as Larry King said a short time ago, even though the, it's a solemn day, it's certainly celebratory up there. 
at the library and it's certainly celebratory down here by more people than just Republicans. So I want to bring in Mary Laurie, who is a lifelong Democrat and also a Reagan voter, a, a Reagan Democrat. Uh, what, why, what was so special about this president? As a president, uh, he had already served wonderful terms as governor in the state of California, so I had to vote for a native Californian and an um, Irish descendant also. And uh, he brought back all the pride in the military after the Vietnam. I'm the wife of a Vietnam veteran and a mother of a son who has been in the service as well. And uh, We should say you're also a fifth generation, fifth generation Californian. Why, why, why was it so important to come out here today? Um, I just felt I had to be part of the history of California and the United States at this time. My family came to California during the gold rush and have lived here ever since. And he is part of California history. And your most enduring memory of the president? Uh, actually, I liked his movies, too. Uh, I was a kid when they were on TV, but I, I remember my father met him one time when he was working for the U.S. government in uh, the San Francisco, or Sacramento office uh, of the governor, and the picture hangs on my father's wall to this day with him shaking Reagan's hand. Thank you very much. Very nice to meet you. We also have somebody out here who was even too young to ever vote for Ronald Reagan, but uh, he's out here today. Born in 1978, was in the Navy. The first person you voted for, Corey Hughes, here with me, uh, was Bill Clinton in 1996. Why, why come out here today? I just think that it's a really big event, and I mean, there's so many people out here, young and old, and it's just really amazing to see just so many people come out and just support and respect um, whether they voted for him or not, and whether they you know, respected what he did or not, they just know that he was a very important person in our country. Do, do you have any memory of Ronald Reagan, and, and what is your, your most enduring memory? <laughs> um, I was, growing up, you know, below 10 years old when he was uh, a president in, in, a, in office, but I just, I do remember uh, knowing a lot about him and just learning about him in school and watching a lot of the great things that he was accomplishing. Um, I, I may have been too young to completely understand what was going on, but looking back now, I really realized how many great things he did for our country and other countries as well. It's certainly been a week of, of remembrance and memory of him. What what has moved you the most during this week? I think uh, on Monday night when I stood in line for seven hours up at the uh, Moorpark College in order to get to the uh, um, to the library, it was just amazing to see the, the, the military members standing next to the coffin and, and uh, just it was just a very moving experience and, and I gave a salute for him and everything because you know being a veteran and just just really yeah. show my respect for the man. Thank you very much. Very nice Thank to meet you. you. Take care. So tens of thousands of people out here certainly at this point uh, they may expect more the uh, the uh, the Hearst and the motorcade the the final motorcade for the former president will be by here in about 15-20 uh, minutes it seems uh, on its way to Simi Valley the, the Reagan National Library halfway between Bel Air where he lived and Rancho del Cielo, the Ranch of the Sky, is the ranch up in Santa Barbara where uh, he made it so famous during his presidency. Back and Miguel, how far into the motorcade route are you? We're a few miles uh, south or southwest of the library itself. Uh, this is one of the most heavily uh, peopled areas that we've seen uh, on the motorcade so far. But uh, some of the pictures I understand, there's, there's just people lining most of the route. Miguel Marquez, thanks so much. We're gonna check back in with Candy Crowley who is standing by inside the Reagan Presidential Library. You know, Candy, every time I hear one of these uh, young men or women talking, uh, particularly those who weren't uh, around when President Reagan was president, talking about what it was that touched him, uh, it seems to be a pretty common thread of, of so many people we've heard from. I'm sure you've seen it there. There was something about uh, his sense of patriotism and his eternal optimism that touches these folks. Uh, absolutely, although th this is the group um, most of whom personally knew Ronald Reagan, um, either through his Hollywood career, uh, we've seen Mickey Rooney here today, uh, Charlton Heston was on the list, uh, we've seen Wayne Newton, and, and also through uh, what was a very close group of friends, uh, pre-governor days, um, uh, the, the widows of, of some of the old friends of, um, of Ronald Reagan. So this is old money and, and old Hollywood, but there are some young faces here. And there are also a number of members of the former president's staff um, who have come, and, and it gives it this kind of uh, reunion sense. Uh, even as uh, the, the military chorus uh, plays um, what obviously are, are funeral songs, there's still a, a feeling of old friends uh, getting together to say goodbye to another old friend. So it's, um, it's a pretty 
um, you know, quiet group, but not a, not a down group. So they come in, they greet each other. Uh, and again, as, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these people have not seen Ronald Reagan for 10 years. So these, these roots of these 700 or so people that are here go way back uh, over the 93 years of, of uh, Ronald Reagan's career uh, in various spots, uh, including Iowa, Hollywood, and, and Washington, D.C. As you mentioned, Margaret Thatcher is coming here um, on the plane. And again, we will hear from the children for the first time since we first learned that their father had died. Paula? Candy, thanks so much. As we continue to watch the motorcade proceed towards the library, Wolf, I'm, I'm struck by the number of references made in the eulogies today about how Ronald Reagan's greatness not only came from his political genius, but it was born out of his relationship in many ways with his wife, Nancy. And uh, there's one thing we want to share with our audience now, and it's their love of music. No one loved music more than Ronald and Nancy Reagan. They loved lyrics, they loved rhythm, they loved to dance, especially to American popular music. And their song was, Our Love Is Here To Stay, by Ira and George Gershwin, so much so that uh, Ronnie, as Nancy would call him, would have actually Nancy sing it to him. They also love the rendition of the incomparable Michael Feinstein, a Gershwin aficionado, who was often invited by the Reagans to play at the White House. And yesterday, Michael Feinstein played for us at the Jefferson Hotel here in Washington. Great to see you. Thank you. Likewise. What happened the first time the Reagans heard you play? It was at the Annenberg's home, and I was playing... Uh, Somewhere my love from Dr. Zhivago, President Reagan, whom I had never met, came over and said, you know, I think that that song added a lot to the success of the movie. I said, I agree with you, Mr. President, because songs do expand the success of a film. And I said, you know, this movie theme. And he looked at me and he said, that's King's Row. That was my best movie. And I said, yes, but I'm glad you recognized it. And from then, uh, from there, we had a conversation about music, and I discovered that he was an avid fan of American pop and music, and knew a lot about composers and songwriters. And I was in heaven listening to the president of the United States not only tell me stories about great songwriters, but also hearing him sing at the sing-alongs at the Annenbergs later. What was it about their favorite song? Our love is here to stay. This spoke to him. Was it the, the beautiful lyrics? I think the combination of music and lyrics being so eloquent. Uh, I wrote writing that lyric after the death of his younger brother George and the meaning of, of that song about how everything in the world is changing but this is something that is real and is lasting and it's going to be around forever and clearly anybody who was ever with the Reagans in a social setting saw this tremendous love between them and whenever I would start to play that song as I did on many occasions they would always hold hands and they would look at each other in a way as if they had just met and fallen in love. And I understand it was very painful for you to play the last time you played at Nancy Reagan's birthday party that the president wasn't capable of attending. Yes, that was that was tough because uh, Nancy was, you could see a, a world of memories in her eyes and everybody was just feeling this, this palpable grief for everything that she'd gone through and seeing an era disappear before our eyes. Would you play the song for us now? With pleasure. The more I read the papers, the less I comprehend the world and all its changes and how it all will end. Nothing seems to be lasting, but that is some doubt of We've got something in common. I mean in the way we can. It's very clear. Our love is here to stay. Not for a year, but ever and again. Just be passing fancy, and in 
I know, Wolf, you had a chance to read some of what Nancy Reagan wrote this week in Time magazine, and I think it was so beautiful when she said, I think, when she wrote of her husband, I think they broke the mold when they made Ronnie. He was a man of strong principles and integrity. He had absolutely no ego. He was comfortable in his own skin. Therefore, he didn't feel he ever had to prove anything to anyone. He said what he thought, and he believed. Paul, oh, that was so beautiful, the, the way Michael Feinstein did that, the way you went over there to the Jefferson Hotel. And got him to sing that song. Uh, that love affair is so special. Uh, let me just point out uh, to those viewers who may just be tuning in, on the left part of our screen, we're seeing that motorcade make its way over to the presidential library, the Reagan presidential library. The right part of the screen, we already see the library where the service will take place, uh, scheduled to begin in about a half hour or so from now. Larry King is going to be walking us through that service shortly. No one more qualified to, to better help us understand what about what is about to unfold. Larry, when you heard Michael Feinstein sing that song, knowing this love affair between Ronald and Nancy Reagan as well as you do, what went through your mind? Now, of course, we talked about that song a lot. Uh, and I would have lunch with Nancy, I would say, once a month. In fact, I had the honor of emceeing that dinner two weeks ago when she made that strong statement about embryonic stem cell research. She loved that song, that was their song. They had an incredible romance. It was a romance right from the get-go. In fact, in March of 1995, uh, Nancy took me on a tour of the Reagan Library here in Simi Valley. And there were some great stories, including one about the marriage proposal from Ron. Watch. Did he propose? Of course, of course. he called my father. Before he asked you? Mm -hmm. And my father said, talk to me. <laughs> how did he ask you and where? He asked me uh, at home. We were at home. In South My Street. home. My apartment. And he said, casually, I called your dad. <laughs> yes. And it's all right with your family. He said, all right with you. Were you coy? No. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think he thought I would be. <laughs> And by the way, tomorrow night, we're going to repeat on Larry King Live a bunch of interviews that I did with Nancy Reagan, tie them all together, and then Sunday Night Wolf and Paula will repeat the last interview we did with the president. That was back in late 1990 or early 1991. So Nancy Reagan tomorrow night and President Reagan on Sunday night. And the beginning of this motorcade is starting to come right behind us. We just saw a couple of motorcycles and a van go by. That tells us that it's not too far away, and they're going to keep right the time. This thing should start right on time, guys. Well, you know, Larry, as you point out, this uh, whole week has been military precision personified. Almost everything has unfolded to, to the second, literally. There was one very, very brief scare when uh, the, uh, the, the presidential jet bringing the casket to Washington on Wednesday was about to touch down. Just before that, there was a false alarm. There was a private jet, of course, that had moved into restricted airspace in Washington. We all got scared. The governor of Kentucky's pilot obviously had a technical problem. It looked like there could be something going on. Thank God it was nothing. Thank God everything came back. The schedule area has been very precise, like clockwork, ever since. Uh, Larry, give our, give our viewers a sense of the people that you know, the friends from the early days of Ronald and Nancy Reagan, who are going to be there at this funeral service. Well, well I've seen most of them. By the way, that was not the motorcade. It was sort of like a preview of the motorcade. It's a couple of motorcycles and a van, sort of like, here's what the motorcade is going to be like when it gets here in a little while. 
You know, someone mentioned Walter Annenberg. Mrs. Annenberg is here. Walter Annenberg was a great friend of the Reagans, former ambassador, founder of a newspaper chain, contributed more to American education than any individual who ever lived. His widow is here. Betsy Bloomingdale, Nancy's closest friend. Someone in uh, Washington reported that Betsy was at the Washington Seminary. She was not. She is uh, here today. And there are many, many like wives of producers, uh, writers, people who work with him. Uh, Warren Cowan was his publicist. Warren Cowan telling everyone the story about how Ronald Reagan for many years would not fly, was afraid to fly. And then when he decided to run for governor, decided that he had to learn to fly, had to accept flying. So they took a flight. He and Nancy to Dallas, stayed in a hotel, flew back, and that began the jaunt to the governorship and eventually the presidency. Had that flight been upsetting, who knows what how history might have been might have been written. But I, I must point out that the uh, and I say it again, these 700 group of invited guests are all all of them to a core people who knew and loved Ronald Reagan and are close close friends of Nancy Reagan. This is going to be, when this ends tonight, at a, I suppose to be over at about 12 minutes after after 10 Eastern time, there's going to be a lot of hugging and tears and laughter in that room because when old friends get together, especially of the Irish vernacular, anything can happen. This is a very special night and a very special ending to a very special week. We'll follow up. Thank you, uh, Larry. Larry just describing to us how really in this, this service reflecting an entirely different part of Ronald Reagan that we've heard earlier today at the National Cathedral. And he talked a little bit uh, about friends being gathered not only from the movie days, but maybe some even representing his days in radio. And Jeff Greenfield, as we bring you back to the conversation here, we should not underestimate the value of uh, the gifts that the president developed during his radio days, not only in learning the cadence that would later become effective in speeches, but learning how to connect with an audience. Yeah, there are a couple of things about Reagan's earlier life that I think get a little short shrift because the actor element of it becomes important. And it was. He was natural in front of the camera. He, he knew the Hollywood press, and that was not bad training for the political press in terms of not taking them too seriously. But the point you mentioned is very important, Paul. We talked about that, I think, the first night. Re Reagan was a man who grew up in, an, in the radio, not television era. And he was one of the most gifted speakers for the ear of anybody I've ever seen in politics. He understood inflection. He understood language. His hero was, after all, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, uh, whose fireside chats became famous. And the other part of that career was when he went to work for General Electric, uh, Older folks like me remember him as host of the GE Theater. He went all across the country talking to GE workers uh, in plants and factories and offices all over the country, answering questions. He had more experience talking face to face with ordinary Americans than any politician who spent his life or her life in the state legislature or Congress. And the last thing I just want to mention, and this is a certain irony, uh, Hollywood is and always has been an overwhelmingly liberal community. We had a glimpse of Norman Lear coming into the ceremony tonight. Norman Lear. Uh, creator of All in the Family, creator also of People for the American Way, a liberal uh, interest group. Uh, the people that uh, Larry mentioned and you mentioned, uh, Wayne Newton, Tom Selleck, Charlton Heston, uh, are a group of sort of semi-endangered Hollywood conservatives. I'm using that phrase ironically. ...face with ordinary Americans than any politician who spent his life or her life in the state legislature or Congress. And the last thing I just want to mention, and this is a certain irony, uh, Hollywood is and always has been an overwhelmingly liberal community. We had a glimpse of Norman Lear coming into the ceremony tonight. Norman Lear, uh, creator of All in the Family, creator also of People for the American Way, a liberal uh, interest group. Uh, the people that uh, Larry mentioned and you mentioned, uh, Wayne Newton, Tom Selleck, Charlton Heston, uh, are a group of sort of semi-endangered Hollywood conservatives. I'm using that phrase ironically. Charlton Heston became famous most recently not as Moses, or as Michelangelo, but is the spokesperson for the National Rifle Association. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, he is now waging his own battle with an early form of Alzheimer's disease. So part of what we're seeing here is Ronald Reagan, the, the man from Hollywood, but whose politics were sharply at variance, as he developed it in later years, with the overwhelming Hollywood liberal um, community. Paul? Thank you, Jeff.
we are continuing to watch the motorcade as it gets closer to the library, and I think well, that's where we're going to catch up with Candy Crowley now. That motorcade is moving along at some uh, 20 miles per hour. That's the uh, the tradition of these motorcades for these state funerals, and there haven't been a whole lot of them in American history. Candy, you're already inside. Have most of the guests already arrived? Uh, yeah, most of the guests are, are here well, right now with Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. There's a, a California um, uh, wing here of politicians as well as you know, former Governor Pete Wilson, uh, former L.A. Mayor uh, Reardon. So uh, that's again a mix of uh, old friends, uh, old Hollywood uh, Republican politicians. As I say, that Governor Schwarzenegger has just arrived with his wife Maria Shriver, uh, obviously a Democrat. Um, it's been uh, very quiet once they walk in here um, and, and sit down and begin to listen to the U.S. Air Force band. Um, so again, a, a, a gorgeous day. Uh, there will be a sunset ceremony. Uh, they uh, basically, I'm not sure what you can see behind me, but they are seated, um, and it will, would be fascinating to know who, who did the seating arrangement, but by section. So they were given a section they were supposed to sit in, uh, and they are moving slowly in. Uh, Wayne Newton, Wayne Gretzky of Hockey fame, uh, Mickey Rooney, uh, any number of people that we do recognize uh, from, from times past. So uh, this is very much a family and friend gathering uh, here and very much a time for these people to reconnect with one another because uh, in fact they have neither seen Ronald Reagan nor each other in, in, in a long time so uh, this has the feel a bit of, of a reunion to send off an old friend. The governor of California speaking with the former governor of California Pete Wilson uh, they're both they both come Maria Shriver sitting in the middle to pay their respects to Ronald Reagan, uh, Candy, as I see the governor of California sitting there, Arnold Schwarzenegger himself, an actor, now the governor of California. There's only one tiny detail that prevents him from possibly moving up to higher office, namely the fact he was born in Austria, not born in the United States. Otherwise, Candy and you cover politics. Arnold Schwarzenegger is pretty popular in California right now, isn't he? Absolutely, right now, and the uh, trans of Gloria, we know that uh, these things can be fleeting, but right now he's quite popular, and in fact he has said before um, that he had a uh, poster of Ronald Reagan in his room. He very much liked Ronald Reagan, very much looked up to him uh, when he came over from Austria as a, uh, as a poor immigrant and then began to, uh, to find his goal here in the West. So uh, there is a, a connection over the generations between this Republican governor and Ronald Reagan. Thank you, Candy. And soon, of course, the sun will be setting on a spectacular California day. But this morning, it was tucked behind somber clouds and rain in Washington as the nation began the final goodbye to its 40th president. A very public day began with private words. A moment of tenderness. Nancy Reagan caressing the casket appearing to speak to her husband one last time. With this, the nation witnessed the ritual of the first presidential state funeral since Lyndon Johnson, 31 years ago. At the National Cathedral, former presidents Ford, Carter, Bush, and Clinton joined President George W. Bush and dignitaries from around the world. Many of today's speakers were chosen personally by President Reagan. Former Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney spoke of Reagan the statesman. Ronald Reagan was a president who inspired his nation and transformed the world. And former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher spoke of Reagan the friend. In his lifetime, Ronald Reagan was such a cheerful and invigorating presence that it was easy to forget what daunting historic task he set himself. Too frail for public speaking after suffering a series of strokes, Mrs. Thatcher recorded her remarks months ago. Amazing grace. And then these emotional words from President Reagan, loyal vice president. As his vice president for eight years, I learned more from Ronald Reagan than from anyone I encountered in all my years of public life. And from President George W. Bush. His convictions were always politely stated, 
affably argued, and as firm and straight as the columns of this cathedral. As the family looked on, the president paid tribute to the love of Ronald Reagan's life. In a life of good fortune, he valued above all the gracious gift of his wife, Nancy. During his career, Ronald Reagan passed through a thousand crowded places. But there was only one person, he said, who could make him lonely by just leaving the room. Ronald Reagan's final goodbye in the nation's capital. A 21-gun salute for the former commander-in-chief at Andrews Air Force Base and the long journey home to his resting place in California. As we watch the procession continue towards the library, Jim Kuhn, we all were, I think, moved by the majesty of what we saw unfold here in Washington today. You were actually at the service at the National Cathedral. Having been the executive assistant to President Reagan, what struck you most about the eulogies and, and the common thread we saw in the eulogies? Uh, the, certainly the remarks by uh, Prime Minister Thatcher, former Prime Minister Thatcher, former Prime Minister Mulroney, uh, but even more significantly, uh, what former President Bush said, uh, the impact that Ronald Reagan had on his life more so than anybody else in all of his public years. What that I was particularly I think, touching to a lot of people to see is former President Bush and is one is publicly given to sharing his emotions. Yes, and it's something that I think a lot of us that uh, logged a lot of years with Ronald Reagan were hoping for and maybe expected years earlier uh, when that uh, exchange of power took place 15 and a half years ago. And, uh, but once again, George Bush was always very gracious to the Reagans and uh, was never, ever, in the eight years that he was vice president, uh, was loyal, never upstaged president once. But there was never that significant statement that I guess we were all looking for, and it happened today. He was such a classy and he waited until the final day to, uh, to live those And what days. were you looking for? Just the acknowledgement yes. that Ronald Reagan was a given human being and what his contribution. Correct. And he said it today. He said it so eloquently. And he said it with such sentimentality. He chucked up. There's so much in Almost yeah. broke down. Uh, Jim Standby and Miguel Marquez is along this motorcade uh, route. He's watching with the crowds. Miguel, tell us where you are and what you're seeing. Well, we're a few, we're a few miles uh, south, southwest of the library. I want to bring somebody in. The DPS is expecting, the uh, Department of Public Safety is expecting about 100,000, maybe as many as 300,000 people to line this route. I'm here with a, a very special person. You hang out in California for any, uh, any length of time and you find somebody famous, Sparky Anderson of baseball fame. What made this president so special? He, the people believed him. They felt, okay, I'll put it this way. You ask what was Ronald Reagan, you could touch him. That means this, when people say, what do you mean you can touch That means he never goes above you, he never goes below you, he is you. Like Ronald Reagan, I talked to him on the phone when we won in 84, and he was unbelievable, and a great Cub fan, you know, and I told him, sorry I won the Cub, but you're the greatest announcer. Well, Vince Scully might but you're the greatest announcer I've ever heard. And he just laughed like that. He loved baseball, but he loved people more than anything. Are you interested in politics as well? Oh, gotcha. You know, this thing about politics, he was able to be him. He come from a poor environment. How many presidents of the United States were poor? I want to know. List them all. This guy was for real. And as I said, if ever we've had a president... Nobody was like Ronald Reagan. Thank you very much, sir. I just love this thing. Yeah. No, we're going to find on the street. He's out here to see the motorcade come by. We expect it in just a few minutes. Wolf? All right, Miguel Marquez, along this motorcade, this motorcade moving follow at approximately 20 miles per hour. That's the custom, the tradition, the hearse leading this motorcade, followed by the limousine carrying Nancy Reagan to this uh, service at the Presidential Library. And we have learned now that most of the invited guests are already at the library in place. And I think we should go back to Larry King now to get a better sense of what he is seeing from there. But Larry, if you hear 
a couple of guest reporters have talked with tonight. It's a, a reminder how effectively President Reagan was able to bridge that gap between his one-time life in Hollywood with his life in Washington. Very well said, Paul, and very great working with you, by the way. We thank Paul Lazan and Wolf Blitzer. We'll be checking back in with Wolf as we take things over here in Simi Valley. And joining us is Gary Foster, a very close friend of the Reagan family, the former White House staffer, one of the key organizers of today's ceremony and director of press events for Ronald Reagan. How's it going so far? Um, it's a, not a hitch, actually. You know, it's an, uh, unbelievable over the last five days. We've gotten 100,000 people up this mountaintop to let them pay respects to the president. Uh, we're organized an event that we think will do just beautiful justice to the president um, in a couple hours here. What was the most difficult part? It was, it was probably the logistical um, aspect of getting all of those people up to this, this mountaintop. Um, there's, there was an unbelievable outpouring of affection for the president, but um, unfortunately it was rather challenging to let them come up here. And there's no parking, um, there's windy roads. So we worked with quite a few municipalities, law enforcement. They could not have been more cooperative. Uh, with us is Gary Foster. Let's check in in Washington with former Senator Bob Dole, the Republican presidential nominee. Senator Dole, what were your thoughts watching that this morning and watching this tonight? I was so pleased that so many people, this good middle-class Americans, uh, uh, still believe in Ronald Reagan and what he stood for and the changes he made in America. You didn't see many, many suits, many ties. You just saw a lot of great Americans who loved this guy because uh, Sparky Anderson just said a few moments ago, you know, he knew who he was and he was as nice to you as he was to the next guy or the next lady or whatever, whether you're rich, poor, whatever religion, whatever color, didn't make any difference to President Reagan. Would you call it Senator Dole a fitting tribute? Oh, I thought it was very fitting. I mean, he had people there that, uh, that you know, Vice President Bush and President Bush and then the real President Bush and uh, Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> Prime Minister Mulroney, I mean, it was just a very fitting tribute to a great guy. With us at the Hilton Hotel in Houston, Texas, where he'll be participating in the 80th birthday party tomorrow night of President George Bush 41, is Mikhail Gorbachev, the former Soviet leader. And Mr. President, what were you thinking as you approached the casket? yesterday afternoon. What was going through your mind? Well, during the day, I've been thinking again about many things that happened in the past. Um, it was the world of destiny that uh, at the most difficult uh, time that the world was going through when it seemed that only a miracle could stop the uh, process of concentration and of attention. We were able together to stop it and this was done. Thanks to the fact that uh, the U.S. leadership, particularly the President of the United States, President Reagan, and the Soviet leadership understood where the world was moving and how far the arms race had gone. I remember the, when I was there, in the history between us, it is really unique. It all began when after the first meeting in Geneva, we even exchanged uh, some bitter remarks, but in Geneva, three days were enough for us to begin to understand each other, and uh, we adopted the statement saying that nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. It was a difficult dialogue. I will not want to be simplistic. It was a very difficult dialogue. But then the trust emerged and uh, it became easier to solve the problem. And he turned out to be the person with whom we were able to get along and then to become friends. And my opinion back. We'll be checking back with the former president of the Soviet Union. Let's go back to Washington, Ed Meese, the attorney general in the Reagan administration from 1985 to 88. 
Ed Meese is a California. Why aren't you out here, Ed? <laughs> I couldn't get back there. Uh, I was here for today's uh, ceremonies, and I have to be here in Virginia tomorrow. What did you think of the ceremonies today? I thought they were outstanding. I thought they were extremely fitting for Ronald Reagan. I think it was a, a way in which we combined two things. One, uh, a, uh, a picture of him as president and what he accomplished for the country, but also, I think through the tributes and through what has happened through this whole week, was this outpouring of affection and gratitude from the American people. I thought all that was combined in the talks and, and in the cer ceremony today. I think particularly uh, the music, uh, everything combined to be a most appropriate tribute to, to a great president. The motorcade is approaching. Well, Blitzer, what was your assessment of what happened this morning? I think it was an incredible day, uh, historically speaking, uh, for all Americans. And what I was also impressed by was the fact that people all over the world, Larry, were watching this event, CNN and CNN International carried this live to more than 200 countries around the world, and I think they were impressed. Uh, this is the first time in more than 30 years we've had this here in the United States, and it's the closest thing we get to some sort of event along this kind of, uh, along these lines. A national day of mourning, a state funeral, Ronald Reagan has did so much to change the world, literally, I don't think you can say he single-handedly ended the Cold War and, and defeated the Soviet Union, but the steps that he took, I don't think there's any doubt, at least contributed significantly to that event, those events, and uh, I think the outpouring of affection reflected that. Gary Foster, we are seeing something extraordinary here. There's the motorcade heading close up to us now. Now the other side of the road, the people heading east or south, they're all, it's like a parking lot. I guess they're just looking, right? No one's stopping them. Right. Um, they're not forced to stop. They're doing it on their own. Uh, yeah. This is something to watch. Just keep, I guess that's just a way of paying respect. You know, it, you know, being in Timmy Valley, it's about halfway between Los Angeles and his beloved ranch up in Santa Barbara. So this is, is truly the heart of, of Reagan country right here. So it's not surprising that, the, that we're going to be seeing large crowds. Bob Dole, what do you think his legacy will be? Well, first let me say it's an honor to be on the program with President Gorbachev. I mean, it takes two to tango, and without the friendship that developed between uh, the presidents, uh, you know, I don't know what would have happened, but because they were able to, you know, cut through a lot of the bureaucracy and, and trust each other, uh, the world was certainly a safer place. And I want to thank him for that. I, I, I think President Reagan divided my view. Now, Ed Meese is much, was much closer to President Reagan than I was. But from the legislator's standpoint, the first term was sort of domestic policy. The second term was foreign policy. And I think there are probably three things that be in the legacy. First of all, the domestic policy, the tax cuts, the economy, and then, of course, helping the, or being the primary mover and ending the Cold War. But even as almost up there, those two are uplifting the, the American people, the morale of the American people. They were looking for someone like President Reagan, and uh, they respected him, they looked up to him, and that was very, very important because we've been in this period of malaise, that uh, people had sort of given up on America, but he made us proud again. President Gorbachev, we know of the, the wonderful relationship you had with your late wife, Raisa. When you were together with the Reagans, was that comparable? Did you see a lot in them of what you had with your wife? We saw and everyone saw the relationship. Ronald and Nancy never concealed their love, their relationship. They were extremely close. They were real friends. And uh, this was really something similar. Although, of course, uh, each of us has its own, uh, one's own uh, uh, life and uh, destiny, but uh, just like President Reagan, I received uh, great support from my wife, moral support, and uh, I admire Nancy Reagan. Uh, she's um, 
a, a wonderful, a beautiful woman, and uh, in her grief, she was very courageous. This is a wonderful example of a family and of the kind of relations between man and woman, and of the role of a woman in the life of uh, a political leader. Yesterday, I had a meeting with uh, her, and uh, we had a very sincere and warm conversation about that time, and uh, we have been in contact with uh, Nancy Reagan these years. So we've been in correspondence all these years. Well, that's very nice to hear. Uh, Ed Mies, are you at all surprised by the outpouring this week? Well, I think all of us have been very gratified by the extent. I know we all expected it, but I, I must say it's exceeded even my expectations of how the public would react. And I think what happened in California with, I understand, over 100,000 people lining up, people were still lined up here today when they had to cut off the uh, viewing. And I think that this outpouring of affection and gratitude is just a tremendous thing uh, for recognition of this great president. If you're just joining us, we're in Simi Valley. I'm Larry King. This is kind of a special edition of Larry King Live. It is the coverage of the laying to rest of the 40th president of the United States, Ronald Reagan. That uh, caravan there you see, the lead car, is approaching uh, the Reagan Library here at Simi Valley where 700 friends of the former president, the late president, and the first lady are gathered for this special service. Wolf Blitzer, were you, and I don't know if Paul is still with you, but were you, were you surprised at the outpouring? Yes, I was surprised. Uh, I was a week ago at, at, at this time, Larry, in Normandy, getting ready to cover the 60th anniversary of V-Day, uh, and uh, all of a sudden, of course, we began to get word early that Saturday morning, a week ago, tomorrow, that Ronald Reagan may be, in, uh, may be getting close to the end, and of course, we began to prepare for that uh, for that development. But even when it happened around 1 p.m. Pacific time, Saturday afternoon, and uh, 4 o'clock Eastern time in the afternoon, it was already late into the night in it France. It, it, it did come as a, a significant, a stunning uh, development, even though, I guess with hindsight, none of us should have been all that surprised. Uh, I didn't really know what to anticipate in the days that followed, but I must say, this week-long official period of mourning here in the United States and the way the outpouring of, uh, of, of solidarity and support for Ronald Reagan, the expressions of friendship, not only of course by those who loved him, the Republicans and conservatives, but also by Democrats and liberals who have come out and, and that demonstration was reflected, Larry, if you looked in the audience at the National Cathedral today, they were all there. Well, Gary, I know military things run on time, but guess what? Run a, little bit late. a little bit late. They right. tell us about 12 minutes from now. It should have arrived now. So, Mr. Foster, how do we explain this? We um, actually had a little time built in oh. to allow the motorcade to slow down when he gets to uh, some residential areas uh, to, to let people pay their respects one last time. Um, and so we are, we're fully aware, and, and I think it'll, it'll still go off without a headshot once he gets up here. Sure. Is that, that some sort of rule that Wolf mentioned, 20 miles an hour? Uh, it will actually maybe slow down to as, as slow as 5 or 10 miles an hour once he gets into some residential areas here in a few blocks. But no, there's there's no rule. Senator Dole, have you ever seen anything like this? Not really. No, and I've been around for a while, but... Uh, you know, I would get up uh, in the middle of the night and turn on C-SPAN. They were still passing through the Capitol, and it was really impressive. But, uh, I, you know, everybody agreed that President Reagan was a great guy, a nice guy. We also, he had a great record. We sometimes overlooked the record, you know, what he was able to achieve. We didn't win them all. I remember one time we'd had a big victory. He called and said, what can I do for you? I said, please call my mother. She's in the hospital. He said, give me her number. He made the call within 30 minutes. Yeah. That's the kind also, of guy. Anyone who knew him knew he was, that, he was that kind of guy. We were at a wedding once, Gary. I mean, I was having lunch with him and Nancy at the Bel Air Hotel. And that day, a couple was getting married. And he poked me in the elbow and he said, let's go over and take pictures with him. <laughs> we walked over and we were suddenly in the wedding party. 
you know, and, and it's a shame that, that because of the con confines that he had when he was president, and even governor to a certain extent, that he couldn't do a lot of that because he really enjoyed it. And he once he, he left office and came back here to California, there's stories like that all the time. You, you know, we'd go to church and, and hang out for, for you know, half hour just greeting people and, and be seen on the golf course and people would um, approach him and he tell stories and jokes and, and he just, you know, I think relished actually being out of office with so he could do quite a bit of that. What are the plans, Gary, regarding the children speaking today? Well, the first time. this will be the first, first time and, and all three of them will speak um, and, and quite honestly, um, they were, will, it's, it's going to, we have not been told what they will, will say or, or read, but um, this will be the, the first and only time that they will actually participate in any of the, the services. President Gorbachev is, is, is the late President Reagan a popular figure in Russia? Well, certainly he is among those who are remembered. And they remember his visit to Moscow. They remember his behavior. They remember his remarks. President Reagan was initially considered as just a hawk, as just a person who is a fierce anti-communist and who had some kind of special hatred towards the Soviet Union. But time later showed that while indeed there were things that he rejected, that he could not accept, and he rejected those things that we ultimately rejected too, that he was a person who had a big heart, a person who had his values, and a person for whom the wish to do something, the wish to make a difference, the wish to support his friends, but in particular to support the entire nation to support the mood of the entire nation. No. This was very, very typical of him. I saw that and I valued the qualities of President Reagan and that's why we were able to get along fairly quickly because we worked together not for too many years, but we were able to do a great deal together. You know, starting things of the kind that we started, the starting the process of reducing nuclear weapons, of ending the arms race. It's difficult, it's hard. It's hard work that we were able to get along with, yeah. were able to speak candidly to each other. My opinion of his human qualities also is very high. He was a great president, he was a wonderful man, he was an extraordinary person. This uh, motorcade has slowed down considerably. I noticed they just got off at Lynn Road, Gary. Will you give us the proximity of Lynn Road to where we are? Uh, it's just about five or ten miles from here, but um, it will take a, a, a while to come up because they're going to slow down. But as you can see, this is more of a residential area, and uh, the crowds are, I, I don't know, 15 people deep, and so they're going to allow um, everybody to, 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 as I said before, pay their respects. We actually have been advertising this group for, for quite a while for those who weren't able to, to either make it to the library or the U.S. Capitol to, to actually you know, say goodbye one more time. What do you think it is? Maybe this is for everyone. What do you think it is, we're telling you, Gary, that brings people out to sit and wait and wait and wait to see a car go by? But I would say you know, it's a combination of, of you know, everything that everybody's been said. You can touch people in so many different ways, whether it was just policies or, or striking a chord from, from you know, the, the less government and, and ending the Cold War, or his just unbelievable humility and warmness that, that he portrayed both in public uh, through just his appearances, but then also, as you said, in private. Um, I, I, I just think there is, you know, there's, he just did not have an enemy in the world. Senator Dole, what do you think it is that people would come out just like this yeah. on a beautiful afternoon to stand on the street? I think there are a lot of similarities between my hero, President Eisenhower, and Ronald Reagan. They had this big smile, and, and uh, they had a lot of respect uh, for different reasons from the American people, cut across party lines, ethnic lines, 
uh, race, uh, and there are parallels between President Kennedy and uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, whether it's cutting taxes or whether it's trying to reduce the uh, bureaucracy. Uh, I think President Reagan, Reagan knew precisely who he was, and the American people liked what they saw, and what they saw is what you got. President Gorbachev, what do you think of the turnout of the events this week and people lining streets and over 100,000 uh, coming to the Capitol and so many coming here to Simi Valley? What do, you, what do you think of this, of the public's love for him? Most of it, uh, I would think for his day, he would his day. Well, that just goes to show, to prove that um, I was right when I've been saying over these days, both in Russia and uh, here, when I came here, yeah. that uh, President Reagan certainly was uh, someone who did a great deal for his own nation and for the world. And um, I think that people are paying tribute to this man who was thinking about people and who was doing a great deal for the people to make their lives better. But he certainly, Ed Meese, was not, not controversial, right? I mean, there was a lot of people who disagreed strongly with Reagan policy. That he uh, was uh, controversial in the sense that he had policies that some people disagreed with, but I think part of it was the fact that he could uh, deal with people who disagreed without being disagreeable. And uh, I know that's a cliche, but it certainly was true in his case. You remember Tip O'Neill, when uh, Tip was uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, there was a lot of differences of opinion on a number of subjects, from tax cuts to uh, supporting the freedom fighters in Nicaragua. But as uh, Ronald Reagan used to say, after six o'clock, we're friends. And so they would put aside the differences, they'd have a, a drink or two together and swap Irish stories, and that was Ronald Reagan. As Wolf, as for Wolf, you pointed out that the liberals, Democrats have turned out in mass for this. Is this kind of a... We're, we're, they're not saying we feel sorry we disagree with you, but they are saying we like you, right? Everybody is saying that. Everybody is saying they like Ronald Reagan, they admire him, his optimism, his happiness, the sense that he was a politician. You could make a deal with him. Uh, all, the, all the Democrats were calling. Yes, they disagreed with him on various policies, but he, he, was, he was a president of the United States that they respected, that they admired, that they could work with and get the job done. Uh, I wonder while we're waiting, Larry, for this motorcade to make its way to the presidential library where you are. One quick question I've always been interested in asking Mikhail Gorbachev, if, if I could, uh, and, and ask him this, because I was there in the Soviet Union at the time. It was August 1991, after the uh, Gulf War, there was a coup d'etat against him, against Gorbachev in Moscow, and eventually turned out to be a failed coup d'etat. But I've always been interested in wondering, had that coup succeeded, and he had been prevented from returning to office, he were arrested, would the Cold War still be in business today? Would the Soviet Union still be in business today? Uh, no, this uh, coup could not succeed. It was uh, a reckless adventure of those who were against the reforms, of those who were against the historical when they saw that their time was uh, a reckless adventure of those who were against the reforms of those who were against the historical when they saw that their time was passing that despite all difficulties the historical was moving forward they uh, did what they did the one day before the signing of a new union treaty that would have created a different union a decentralized the democratic union and uh, i never hesitated when I was there, when I was isolated uh, and walked, and when I was declared a sick person, I had no doubt that the coup would be defeated, and it was defeated. Mr. Gary Foster, what was he like to work for? 
couldn't have had a better boss. Uh, you know, especially for for what you know I was doing, which was putting him out in public events where he could do what he did best, and that's communicate to, to people. Uh, he was a natural at it. Um, you know, we we gave him settings, but he. Um, he took it and, and ran with the ball, and um, you know, behind the, the stage is the same man you saw in front. Um, he was as, as, as much of a gentleman and polite and humble, um, as I said before, as um, he, he appeared to be in, in, on the stage. We're talking with Gary Foster, a close friend of the Reagan family, former White House staffer, and one of the key organizers of this event today, which will wind up soon here at the Reagan Library for the ceremonies and the laying to rest of the 40th president. Also with us is the former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, Senator Bob Dole, the former Senate Majority Leader, Ed Meese, the former Attorney General, and CNN anchor Wolf Blitzer. One of his closest political friends, former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, paid respect to her good friend of today's National Cathedral Service. And although Lady Thatcher was in attendance, in fact, she flew on the plane with Nancy Reagan and is coming here tonight, her message was pre-recorded because of her own health problems. Listen. As Prime Minister, I worked closely with Ronald Reagan for eight of the most important years of all our lives. We talked regularly, both before and after his presidency, and I've had time and cause to reflect on what made him a great president. Ronald Reagan knew his own mind. He had firm principles, and I believe right ones. He expounded them clearly. He acted upon them decisively. When the world threw problems at the White House, he was not baffled or disorientated or overwhelmed. He knew almost instinctively what to do. Senator Dole, how do you explain Thatcher Reagan? Well, it's a great friendship. Again, they trusted each other. They were friends. They had the same philosophy. They stuck to their guns. Uh, you know, she didn't wobble. Don't get wobbly. I remember she saying one time to President Bush 41, and he didn't, of course. But uh, I think it's just that, you know, both conservative, but had some flexibility, willing to compromise, civility, I mean, all these things that we've talked about. Ed Meese, did he and, and, and Margaret Thatcher genuinely also, in addition to agreeing, liked each other? Yes, they certainly did. Uh, they had a lot of, uh, they liked to joke together. They uh, had spent a lot of time together at these industrial summits uh, when they attended as well as on other visits. If you remember, Margaret Thatcher was the, uh, had, had the first uh, luncheon uh, with, from a foreign uh, head of government uh, after Ronald Reagan was inaugurated because they had already met, uh, they had already talked, and he was very fond of her, what she had done in England, uh, but then also, uh, from that point on, their friendship developed. One of the things that was very important was they reinforced each other because almost all the heads of state that attended those industrial summits at the start of uh, their respective terms uh, were socialists. And so uh, they really carried the banner, and interestingly enough, when Ronald Reagan left office, almost all of the uh, heads of state uh, of the eight, uh, seven industrialized nations were center-right or uh, free enterprise oriented. Gary Foster, we are being told now that this motorcade is about 15 minutes away. Is that what you read? Do you know the area? Yes, and in fact, I just got, I, I'm sitting here with my Blackberry in my lap and just got a message from somebody in the motorcade who's actually worked for Ronald Reagan since he, 1979 when he was running for president. Um, and has been virtually every rally and parade route that he ever ever took, and he said he has never seen anything like this before. Um, really? Yes. Yeah. He he he. Well, it's a very short message, but he said it was, it was literally hundreds of thousands of people, and he's never seen such a sustained crowd for so long. Um, all even during his presidency. Um, well, what do you what do you make of this? Well, it's an amazing development. It's, a, it's an under, underscore, it underscores how special Ronald Reagan was to so many Americans. And, and it's not just Americans who remember him necessarily personally, because we've seen a lot of young people out there as well, Larry. Uh, you know, it, it's, well, you asked earlier why people do this, why they just go out on the street and, and want to get a glimpse of this curse, of this motorcade, of these limousines that are moving forward. I think they sense that this is history unfolding right now, and it's 
one opportunity that they have they'll be able to share with their children and their grandchildren. I remember when I was a young kid growing up in Buffalo, New York, Larry, I don't know if you went through a, an experience like this, but I remember once in the town of Tonawanda, a suburb I had heard with a bunch of my buddies and I was in junior high that Bobby Kennedy uh, was running for the Senate in New York State and was going to be at some event. And we just decided we're going to stop playing baseball. We're going to go over there and get a glimpse. I didn't even know Bobby Kennedy was, but I knew that he was the brother of President Kennedy, and I just wanted to see it. And you know what? All these years later, Larry, I still remember very vividly that glimpse of Bobby Kennedy when he was running for the Senate in New York State. Yeah. Yeah. Also, Gary, you would attest to this, how much President Reagan loved sweets. Not just jelly beans. Because I had uh, lunch with him once, and he had a hot fudge sundae for dessert, and he scraped the bowl. Well, it's funny. Love hot yeah. fudge sundae. The, the only advantage of him traveling to events without Mrs. Reagan, because you knew he would rather, much rather have, him, uh, have her by his, his side at all times, was he got to eat the dessert when when he went on the road. You know, she helped him watch his weight and and, and eat a healthy diet, and very seldom have a, had a dessert when she was around. But when he was on the road without her, that was his, his biggest treat, was being able to eat his dessert. It can be safe to say that Nancy eats like a bird. Yes, Nancy yes. does not have much of an appetite. Does not have a huge appetite. As we await this motorcade's arrival at the Presidential Library, again, running late, running late because of unexpected crowds of people lining streets, causing the motorcade to slow down. They were due here to start this ceremony 17 minutes ago, and now they tell us they're about 10 to 12 minutes away. Let's show you some highlights of today's services at the National Cathedral. Tip O'Neill as they did and Ronald Reagan and that uh, unusual friendship of laughs and jokes. That doesn't seem to exist today, correct? I think that there's uh, much less civility today, uh, much positions have hardened, and uh, I think the, that the friendly spirit between two sides coming together after 6 o'clock uh, is, is pretty hard to find. It's tough. It's tough out there. It's tough. What, I remember, what went wrong, Senator Dole? I remember once President Reagan was kidding. He said, why should I remember all our names? Only about a half of them voted for me anyway. You know, we were down there talking about who voted this way and that way. But, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think there's... This may help us a little bit. I think the American people are going to view this view it for almost five, for five days. And they may be asking their member of Congress, regardless of party, you know, why can't we have a little more stability? Why can't we get together? Why can't we have necessary... Compromise. You know, President Reagan said, "Give me 80 percent, I'll get the 20 next year." Uh, and I think that's uh, the spirit that's going to be around for a long. This is going to last for a while. This isn't going to disappear tomorrow morning. My view is it's going to last for some time. What do you think, Wolf? When did it change? When did we become less civil? You know, we we all thought after 9/11 that we would be back at that in that level of civility in the political discourse of our country that uh, we would never again have the kind of bitter partisanship that had been 
so frequent in, 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 let's say, during the Clinton years, for example, when things got ugly on, on many, many occasions. But we've recently seen, and I think Senator Dole will agree, a return to that kind of bitterness, that political acrimony, the kind of spirit that he doesn't like, the kind of spirit he's hoping will, will disappear, at least in the short term. Unfortunately, I'm not as upbeat as Senator Dole because I sense in the coming days, especially after the sunset service tonight, politics are going to come back pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, all the bitterness is going to roar right back as we get closer to the conventions and the November 2nd election. It's just going to be a heated political campaign over the next few weeks and months. And, and I'm not sure that the Ronald Reagan uh, national period of mourning is necessarily going to spill over and create a new era of goodwill, if you will. That'd be an opportunity. That's what Ed, oh. uh, Senator Dole, what do you think of that in Ed Meese? Senator well, I think, I, think, I think probably, you know, Wolf is the expert, but I, I think you're going to see some of this again at the Republican Convention. It's obviously, Ronald Reagan is going to be uh, going to be a centerpiece in what, what happens to the Republicans, but that's going to be a message again to all the American people, not just Republicans. So my view is that it's uh, they're going to be, it's going to last, I think, uh, you know, to be a little bit political, I think it's uh, a plus for President Bush. Well, I, I, I've been concerned particularly, I don't know that we've ever had as much division between the parties while the nation has been at war. And we are at war right now, and I've been particularly disturbed by the attacks on the Commander-in-Chief, uh, particularly from some of those uh, who don't only disagree with his policies, but uh, have made the attacks personal. And I think that kind of bitterness is that uh, it doesn't belong in a country like ours. But what caused it? I don't know. Maybe it's uh, maybe it has something to do with leadership. Maybe it has something to do with uh, just the way in which the parties uh, have perhaps gotten uh, more uh, hardened in their positions uh, and perhaps more polarized. Well, it's a very close division in Congress too, and that always leads to you know more confrontation. And when it's 51 to 49 in the Senate, that makes it very difficult for either leader to uh, have much of an impact. That's true, and and of course, supposed to tell us. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, uh, I would, I think that uh, what Senator Dole has said is, is true, that the, the closeness and the division that is pretty close between the country as a whole, uh, as revealed in polls and that sort of thing, probably is a contributing factor. Gary Foster, what are we seeing now? Now, this is on the stage, right? This is. Uh, we saw some minor guards getting in place, so it's obviously the, the motorcade is, is getting very close, but you know, because this is a, a state funeral, the armed services are extremely involved in, in this entire proceedings over the last six days. So we have military bands, we have honor guards, um, the, the, um, the guys move the caskets are from all, all armed services. Uh, so you're going to see quite a bit of pomp and ceremony here. And it's, uh, all in place are getting in place as we, as we watch. And we have the U.S. Air Force Band and the U.S. Army Chorus, right? That's correct. Uh, you're going to see a couple F-18s flying over at the end of the service, so it's, uh, uh, you know, it's well represented by our armed services. I think we're well, going to open out, apparently, it's just the commercial jet. Senator Doe, you want to say something? Well, I think just what Gary said, I did. we ought to also reflect upon the young men and women who are serving in Iraq and Afghanistan this week. Uh, we lost uh, soldiers this week. But I think when you see all these young men and women who participated this whole five days in all these ceremonies, it makes you proud. Proud of the young men, proud of the young women. And I know if President Reagan around, he'd be saluting left and right. Uh, also, you were watching the California Highway Patrol uh, motorcycles going by the motorcade. And we, just, we were asked um, if it was possible if a lot of the, the guys who did that while he was president and governor were able to come up and, and have a special time before he left uh, Simi Valley to, to go back to, to Washington to pay their respects. And we ended up having um, several thousand armed, sir, uh, excuse me, law enforcement officials from the LAPD, California Highway Patrol, multiple groups come up here at the very end um, of the lane and in, in repose here in, in, at the library um, on Monday. And it was, it was quite emotional for those guys to all file by, salute in their uniforms. President Garfield, as a visitor to this country, what yeah. did you think of the service this morning? Как гость страны, как оцениваете сегодняшнюю службу? Yeah, I had the feeling 
Uh, that was very emotional. Uh, when uh, this farewell to the president was happening. The service was done with tremendous respect. It was extremely well organized. It was really very impressive. And perhaps um, all television channels uh, showed uh, moments of President Reagan's life and um, his uh, talks about his final years, and I think that that gave a lot of food for thought. I am now taking part in this uh, conversation with you, and uh, uh, you have been discussing a number of the themes and subjects, because those are kind of lessons and uh, this, these are the lessons that you are drawing from today and from yesterday. The American nation, I think, has shown, despite all differences that exist in a free society, in a democratic country, has shown itself quite unanimous in uh, expressing the feeling of uh, gratitude. And you may be right that this is precisely because people are comparing the politics of today and the politics of that time, particularly uh, during the second term of his presidency. Okay, Foster, what can you tell us? Where are we now? Well, we're here in the helicopter that's just above the motorcade, so, so it's uh, just a matter of, of minutes away. Now, give us the, how they come in here. Well, they come up Presidential Drive, uh, a winding which road. is a winding road up to the top. Of presidents, so yes, the yes, with all 42 uh, presidents um, on the way up. Right above us. Um, and we'll arrive at the front of the library. Uh, Miss Reagan will get out of her limousine once she's in place. The casket will be removed from the hearse. It will be transported through the courtyard of the library, through the library itself, and out to the, to the, the backyard for the ceremony. Following the ceremony, the burial, will they place, will, will that take part of it through the placing of the body in the ground? Yes, once the ceremony is over, the casket will proceed over to the place of burial. Mrs. Reagan will follow, be put in place, will be allowed a few moments to, to say her final goodbye. Um, Reverend Finning, who is their, their pastor, will say an invocation, um, taps the 21-gun salute, and the folding of the flag is presented to Mrs. Reagan. It's going to be quite emotional. The contested Ascoli is going to be preceded by a bagpipe that oh, yeah. um, will be playing Amazing Grace that I think will be um, very, very emotional. At some services, they'll throw pebbles on the, on the casket or some sort of reminder of people's association. People, uh, all the guests here, all 700 guests, once Mrs. Reagan um, leaves, will be able to file by. So I'm sure we will uh, see everybody paying respects in their own way. Now we have pulling in right behind us about five or six California Highway Patrolmen on motorcycles. We hear a helicopter directly above the head, above our heads. We are, we are where now? We are looking out. Is that Simi Valley? This is Simi Valley. Um, and we're on one of the mountaintops overlooking the valley. Uh, it's just, it's just a, you know, as you were talking earlier, it's a spectacular sight that this library sits on top of. The, the library is right sort of there. Right? That's, That's right. correct. That's correct. Right over our shoulder. This is some scene, Senator Dole. I wish you were here. This is a, an incredible uh, setting. Have you been to this library? I've been there. I had the great honor to speak uh, there on one occasion, and uh, that, it, it is a beautiful sight. Uh, Stanford University made a big mistake when they, you know, they, they're the losers, and they deserve to lose because all those liberal professors didn't want anything to do with President Reagan. What is that story? I don't know. Well, I think that maybe Ed Neese could fill you in, but I think that's the original plan. I, I may be wrong, but... No, uh, Larry, originally the, the thought was that the uh, 
the uh, presidential library would be up uh, on Stanford University uh, in uh, Northern California, where it would be close to the Hoover Institution, where a number of uh, people had worked for the Reagan administration. And uh, there were some objections on the campus uh, there, unfortunately, from some of the uh, more liberal people. Uh, Ronald Reagan said, well, if there's any going to be any controversy, we'll have to find someplace else. And, and of course, they found it what is probably, uh, in the long run, a much better spot down where it is now in Simi Valley. It's a beautiful place. I, I was honored to be on the, one of the trustees, the founding trustees that built the library initially. And uh, it's just a, a marvelous site. And I think in the long run, it worked out for the best, which is kind of typical of Ronald Reagan, I think, in what's happened in his life. I had the honor of speaking here once, and I uh, noticed that uh, Senator Howard Baker is coming to speak in uh, August, and uh, Justice O'Connor will be speaking here in September. That's a regular thing, right? Yes, yes. They, they really they have um, outstanding speakers on a regular basis um, uh, come up with, um, yeah, as, as part of it as the library program. It's a beautiful library, and a great part of it also, if you're visiting out there, and they're expecting tons of visitors, as you see the motorcade coming sort of up the hill, uh, there's a great uh, tribute to his uh, days as an actor. Lots of posters and pictures and uh, sights and sounds around Beverly Hills and Los Angeles. Have you been here, Wolf? Yes, uh, I've been there, Larry, and it is a fabulous place to, uh, to visit, uh, to experience history. Anyone who wants to learn something about Ronald Reagan will appreciate what's going on. The other day, uh, when I was in Normandy, France, uh, covering the D-Day anniversary, uh, Douglas Brick Brick Brickley, the presidential historian, was there. He was just there not that long ago, a few weeks ago, and he had some access to some of Ronald Reagan's diaries. And he told us a story, Larry, and I'm sure Gary might want to weigh in on this, that when Ronald Reagan was president, every single day, virtually every single day, he was so disciplined, he would hand write he would write with his own words some thoughts of what happened that day, some reflections. He didn't dictate them to a secretary or to a machine. He would just simply write in his diary. And, and those diaries are going to be made available to historians uh, in the not too distant future. And I think a, a, another side of Ronald Reagan, yet another dimension, will come forward. I don't know if Gary wants to talk about that or if he's had access to those diaries, but it's going to be a fascinating new uh, treasure trove for historians and biographers. Well, Wolf is right, and, and Attorney General Meeskin can say, uh, you know, witness this, he's curious. You know, Ronald Reagan wrote most of his speeches longhand uh, before he was elected president, and so he was a fabulous writer, and he was encouraged and challenged to actually chronicle you know, every day, as Wolf said, um, his presidency, and so we will have access to those um, at some point, which um, I'm sure will be, um, every story will be fascinating. Did you ever read any of it? Uh, I've never read any, but he told me about some of the entries that he's made uh, over the years, uh, and I think uh, it's correct, he was a very disciplined person. There's another aspect to his discipline, which is why he was so healthy, and that is that he also worked out every night. Those were the two things he did. Uh, do his exercises, the uh, treadmill and weightlifting, and also uh, write in his, uh, in his daily journal. Now the motorcade is coming up the hill, coming right to the library. We've had uh, quite a number of motorcycle cops pull into the area where we are already. What's the purpose of the helicopter, Gary? Well, it's a combination of, of security, but we also had a helicopter up there with a camera in it, so the, the world will continue to be able to see the, the coverage. But there's always um, a security helicopter above every motorcade movement. Can I ask, uh, uh, Larry, uh, can I ask uh, Gary a question? Why the family didn't want that helicopter shot on the motorcade that brought the casket and Mrs. Reagan from the presidential library the other day to the... Uh, a Point Magoo uh, Naval Air Station, yet on the return, they've, they've invited the media to show this motorcade virtually going the whole way. Um, it was not the, the, the family's decision. Uh, unfortunately, in this era in which we live in, uh, there's probably no fewer than a dozen agencies that had to approve it, and unfortunately, we did not get all those agencies to approve it. Uh, and in fact, the Secret Service agent that was in charge of this entire event, just he was on the phone this morning with Homeland Security to finally get the approval for the helicopter to the, today. But uh, airspace uh, and all security arrangements have been elevated just 
tremendously, even since I was in the White House 10 years ago, because of the, the era in which we live in today. Where is the hearse now? Okay. It, this presidential drive, just literally a, a matter of a, a few hundred feet away from where we're sitting. So we should be seeing this. Will it come right behind us? Yes, yeah. come right behind us. Okay, we're sort of around this bend here, right? Yes, yes. This is part of the windy road up to the, to the library. If you come to this library, if you're ever out in the Simi Valley area in California, and it's about a, on an easy traffic day, about an hour from Los Angeles. From Los Angeles, that's correct. Straight up to 405, which is kind of a parking lot, but sometimes... Yeah, I'm on a good day. It's, it's an hour. And uh, these cars are now winding up. We expect them to come right by us momentarily. And then again, they will go to the front of the building. Yes. The casket will be removed. Yes. Carry through the will the viewers will get to see them carry through the main entrance. Carry through the courtyard into the main entrance of the library, through the library momentarily, and into the back lawn, which is where we will see the sunset. I mean, Larry, they're getting a little bit of the sun still out there, right? I mean, it's getting a little, not quite as bright as the weather. Are we going to be playing it close, Gary, here on sunset? What is sunset? Um, no, actually, because it's a little bit later, I think it's even going to be that much more dramatic because the sun won't set until actually behind the mountains about 745. So once the service is, is about over, we will see the sun disappear behind the mountains. So in other words, if they, if they start this in seven, eight minutes, this will be right at sunset. Yes, this, this will be perfect timing, actually. So what we're saying, Gary, is you deliberately this is exactly what we ought to tell you the truth. Through the keen eyes of Senator Dole, who observes weather well. That's we right. have some military men standing near us right here, over to our left, awaiting the arrival of the presidential motorcade. Do you have events like this in Russia, President Gorbachev? tradition is different in Russia, although of course uh, there is a farewell, and uh, there is the viewing of the body in the coffin, and there is music that accompanies the event, and uh, there are remarks and speeches made. At the okay, I want to interrupt you, Mr. President, just a moment. The hearse is, this is the hearse, is it not? Yes. yes. Right by us, Gary. We are right next to it. Okay. And there we see the flag draped coffin. The cars behind us. And as they pull around this turn, they're going to be right at the entrance to the building, right? That's correct. That's correct. Just hit stop, just dragging, get out of her limo momentarily. Wind blowing out there a little. Not bad. No, but there's, there's a nice breeze, but it's not too bad. Larry, what's the service? No, no, I, I, no, uh, excuse me, Larry, is it a one hour service? Is that what we anticipate? Yeah, right, Gary? Yeah, so wait about one hour. Hour. It's a yes. one, exactly one hour, one hour service. That's correct. I want to thank Senator Dole. I know he's going to be leaving us. Uh, We'll hang out here and watch this whole thing along with you, and then have a wind-up and have our guests comment at the at the end of this service what they thought about it. I know Senator Dole has to leave us. Thank you much, Bob. Thank you, Larry. It's a great honor to be on the program on a President Reagan. Thank you. Our honor to have you. And thanks for staying so late, running almost 45 minutes late from the start of things. We actually took the air. Uh, hosting this program almost an hour ago. Now, Gary, where will you go? Well, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to go take my seat at the service. And I don't mind at all. Do my best to my wife. I sure will. I'm sorry you're not going to be able to join us, but I understand. But someone, someone has to do this. That's right. right. Might as well be me. Well, for Blitz, we'll be standing by. Ed Meese will be standing by. Mikhail Gorbachev will be standing by at the Hilton Hotel in Houston. We thank Bob Dole for being with us. Candy Crowley is on the scene. We'll be checking in with her as you watch the family disembark and head toward the centerpiece of the library, the main entrance to the library. Let's see if we can pick up any sound. Let's just watch.
almost 50 minutes late in starting. That was due to some planned lateness with the enormous crowds along the highway and streets along the way on the route from the Naval Air Station to here. And now there seems to be some slow up here. I don't know what this is. Ed Meese, you have a guess as to what this might be? Says that isn't connected with us. Whoa. I think what they want Not is to give the family a chance, Larry, to freshen up inside before they emerge. They yeah. had that long drive in from the Naval Air Station. They wanted to give Mrs. Reagan and everyone a chance to, uh, to simply freshen up a little bit. Now the family, we see them walking out for this service about to begin. Uh, the, the immediate children, of course, of Ronald uh, and Nancy Reagan and Michael Reagan himself right there with his wife yeah. as well. Uh, I, I don't think there was anything more to it than simply that letter. I agree, Wolf. Good thinking. Here comes the rest of the procession that are filing in. They'll take their seats in the front. There are a total of about 700 people here. And as we told you earlier, almost all of them, close friends of the President and or the First Lady, they now take their seats in the front. This ceremony is moments away from beginning in this beautiful setting, northwest of Los Angeles, Simi Valley, California. Folks are being seated. The program is about to start. If they stay to the program we've been handed in front of us, there'll be four ruffles and flourishes and a playing of hail to the chief poem by Sir Walter Scott, music by James Sanderson, hail to the chief, first associated with the United States Chief Executive in 1815, when it was played to honor George Washington at the end of the War of 1812. First living president to be honored was Andrew Jackson in 1829. There's Ron Reagan and Michael Reagan and their wives. You see Mrs. Thatcher directly behind Ron Reagan, the president's youngest son, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you see the top of Arnold's head, and he is behind, well, sort of in between Ron Reagan and Michael Reagan's wife, the rest of the party comes in, the sun, as they tell us, an hour away from setting, this was planned as a sunset burial, Proceeding should start momentarily. Let's watch.
pray with me. Eternal and almighty God, we began this day and it seemed the heavens were weeping as we paid our farewell to your servant, Ronald Reagan. We eulogized him. We worshiped under the arches of that safety cathedral. We have come from sea to shining sea to this soil which he loved so much and where his body will remain. Gracious Lord God, turn our tears of sorrow into the hope of the resurrection. Comfort our hearts and especially the Reagan family and the nation. For we celebrate his life and we do it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. and repair funds to people with backed up sewers. Kemmelbam's Jody Schwan looks into the flooding financial aid. The city estimates 80 homes reported backed up sewers during last week's flooding. Now adjusters and another city program will determine how much... Back to f funeral. And someplace, flowing from years long past, a river will wind towards the city. Across those fields he will ride a gray mare he calls Nancy Dick. They will sail over jumps he has built with his own hands. He will let the river carry him over the shining stones. He will rest in the shade of the trees. Our cares are no longer his. We meet him now only in memory, but we will join him soon enough, all of us, when we are home, when we are free. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
Reagan family, distinguished and honored guests, it is a wonderful, awesome responsibility for me to be able to give these final parting words on this long journey of this week of sadness. I want to thank you for the privilege of being your pastor and chaplain to the president. Little did I think that four and a half decades ago when Fried and I came to this country to study in college, that one day I would end up as the chaplain to the President of the United States, only in America. Dear Nancy, thank you for bearing your grief so nobly. Thank you for the dignity that you have shown this week. Our hearts have gone out to you. So many people have commented on the picture where you and I are together as we began this week. And I think the reason for its poignancy was that the whole American nation was putting its arm around you. And so we love you and care for you. Thank you for caring for the President in his declining years. Thank you for the wonderful example of your marriage that you modeled throughout your life together. And especially in the White House years, yours was truly a glorious friendship based on mutual love and respect. And we love you for it. And thank you for it. To you, Michael, and Patty, and Rob, thank you for those very, very touching and moving words. A little humor, but the heartfelt love of children who love their father and respect him so much. We gathered at the beginning of this long day in the National Cathedral and heard so many wonderful words from the nation's leaders and also from a beloved friend. I have never heard Lady Margaret Thatcher speak more eloquently in all her life. The last time when I heard her speak, I had the privilege of being present as she was awarded the Ronald Reagan Freedom Award. And I remember her saying particularly, when Ronnie spoke about the Soviet Union and the evil empire, even I blanched. Thank God that neither she nor your husband shirked in the face of communism, but saw its demise. He touched us all. When I back, went back to the land where I was born in South Africa, I went to see my aging father. And as I sat in his study, he pointed to a huge picture behind me framed. It was of your husband. And he said, this is my president 10,000 miles away he identified as we all do and shall do through time to come it now remains for me to talk about the man and his faith indeed he was a gift from God to us all he made us feel good and confident about ourselves about our country and about our future and I believe it's because he gained his confidence from the psalm which I read at the beginning of this week, Psalm 46, where the psalmist says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. When you attended church, so many people noticed that he could sing the hymns without looking at the hymnal. He loved hymns. And it was appropriate that it was sung in the cathedral this morning and played on the bagpipes this evening. That hymn speaks about God's amazing grace. And Ronald Reagan knew of the grace of his Lord Jesus Christ, for he lived with and on and in that grace. I think of that one particular stanza of that hymn which says, Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. His grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace 
will lead me home. Grace has led him home this day. He was a man who exhibited graciousness with all that he met, from the highest in the land to the lowliest. On one occasion, when Alzheimer's was beginning to rob that beautiful mind, and he no longer came to Valley Presbyterian Church, you know that I came to the office regularly and brought the church to him and then to your home. And on one occasion, his secretary said, Mr. President, your pastor is here. Come and sit in the corner of his office. And uh, he said, no, I think I'll just sit here at the desk. I looked at her, she looked at me, we knew he wasn't going to budge. So I sidled up and sat on the edge of the desk and I said, Mr. President, you're still boss, I'll sit where you are. And so I read scripture and prayed. Shortly afterwards, his secretary ushered in my wife and he stood up immediately and went over to her and shook her hand. You see, the gentleness, the kindness, the love, the gifts, the fruit of the Holy Spirit was deeply embedded in his DNA. As Ron has already said, in 1994 he wrote that letter saying, I now begin my journey into the sunset of my life. But I believe that last Saturday, he began a new journey into the glorious presence of Almighty God. And he is basking in the sunshine of his love. And I believe he's touching the face of God, as he said, during the Challenger disaster. And the Lord is saying to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Let me close with just one thought. In the ancient nation of Israel, when the temple had been built, the Lord appeared to King Solomon and said to him, these words, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways and pray and seek my face, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. God was reminding his ancient people that the glory of the nation was not in power or prestige, in wealth or in might. Ronald Reagan knew that as a cardinal truth, that ultimately our strength is not in our might, but it is as we depend upon Almighty God and trust in Him and walk humbly before God. Ronald Reagan lived and believed that and thank God that he did. Mr. President, I salute you. Thank you.
pray with me? Now, eternal God, we commend into your hands the spirit of your servant, Ronald Wilson Reagan. We commend him into your care and keeping. And as we do so, we commit ourselves afresh into your love and care. Teach us to so live that we shall never ever be afraid of death, nor ever ashamed to see you face to face. But grant that your love and peace may rest with us now and always. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord made his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace now and forevermore. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Library, overlooking the valley he loved, Simi Valley, California. This service comes to an end. So will our portion of the program, but I want to get some comments from some of the guests. Ed Meese, what did you think of what you just saw? I thought it was a marvelous ending to a very spectacular tribute to the president and having his children there uh, give those heartfelt remarks uh, as well as having the, the entire ceremony there uh, with the sunset and all was uh, the proper close uh, for what he would have liked uh, and what uh, is really appropriate in uh, ending this chapter in our history of our country. I also think that the, the military presence throughout this the events of the week would have been is very important to Ronald Reagan. He was a military man himself, as you know, having been an officer during World War II. And that, combined with all the other aspects of this tribute, I think is a very fitting memorial to him. Beautifully said. President Gorbachev, what is your reflection on this evening? Understandably so, this is the last time she's going to even be that close to her husband, uh, Ronnie, who she called him Ronnie, she loved him so very much, and, and I was touched by the fact that her children came up behind her as soon as they saw her begin to lose her a little bit. This is a powerful woman, Larry, as you point out, she may be frail, but she's very, very strong. And me, were you surprised that she finally did break down? No, not really. She's been a strong person, as uh, Wolf said. She is a strong person, but uh, this emotional moment, uh, I think uh, her reaction was what we might expect, and, and uh, we can sympathize with her. Wolf, I guess you I might uh, tie in together. You couldn't have Hollywood scripted this better. This was about as perfect a scene as, as Larry as you can imagine. What a fitting ending to Ronald Reagan, 93 years old, the 40th president of the United States, literally fading into the sunset of the Pacific right now. What a, what a spectacular moment. At least I know you know this scene very well. Spent a lot of time in California. I don't want to sound like a overly done loving Californian, but can't beat the sunsets. No, you certainly can't. And Ronald Reagan loved those sunsets, whether they were at the ranch, or whether they were here at the library, and I agree with Wolf. This is a, a most fitting way to end the day and to memorialize the life of one of our greatest presidents. There you see the sun fading in the distance at about one minute before eight o'clock Pacific Coast time. This long day started back in Washington, D.C. many hours ago with that incredible service at the National Cathedral and ends tonight here at the Reagan Library in Simi Valley, California. As all of the 700 guests get to go by and give their last goodbyes to the 40th President of the United States. One of those, of course, the former Prime Minister of Great Britain. Thank you. 
It's kind of a recap, Russ. Uh, that, the ending was the sunset, and this is a, kind of a recap deal. News night, but news night still, and it begins at the beginning of a day of long goodbyes. The nation's first state funeral in more than three decades began simply with a gentle kiss.
receive the body of our brother Ronald for burial. Let us pray with confidence to God, the giver of life, that he will raise him to perfection in the company of the saints. Inside the National Cathedral, in front of all of the country's living ex-presidents, and with the world watching, the final chapters of Ronald Reagan's long goodbye began in prayer. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For if we live, we live unto the Lord, and if we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, even so shall the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. cannot be numbered. Accept our prayers on behalf of thy servant Ronald and grant him an entrance into the land of light and joy. Even youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fail. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not feel things. <laughs> they spoke of history changed, words spoken by some who felt changes. Margaret Thatcher, frail now, spoke her words on tape. Hence brought America and its allies with renewed faith in their mission of freedom. Others saw only limits to growth. He transformed a stagnant economy into an engine of opportunity. Others hoped at best for an uneasy cohabitation with the Soviet Union. He won the Cold War, not only without firing a shot, but also by inviting enemies out of their fortress and turning them into friends. One day, in Brussels, President Mitterrand, in referring to President Reagan, said, Il a vraiment la nation de l'État. Rough translation, he really has a sense of the state about him. The translation does not fully capture the profundity of the observation. What President Mitterrand meant is that there is a vast difference between the job of president and the role of president. President Bush the Elder was never better, balancing a nation's sorrow with great good humor. As his vice president for eight years, I learned more from Ronald Reagan than from anyone I encountered in all my years of public life. I learned kindness. We all did. I also learned courage. The nation did. Who can forget the horrible day in March 1981? He looked at the doctors in the emergency room and said, I hope you're all Republicans. And then I learned decency. The whole world did. Days after being shot, weak from wounds, he spilled water from the sink. And entering the hospital, hospital room, aides saw him on his hands and knees, wiping water from the floor. He worried that his nurse would get in trouble. The book, good book says, humility goes before honor, and our friend had both, and who could not cherish such a man? And perhaps as important as anything, I learned about a lot about humor, a lot about laughter, and oh, how President Reagan loved a good story. When asked, how did your visit go with Bishop Tutu? He replied, so-so. 
twice his son spoke of a nation's loss. In his last year, he saw through a glass darkly. Now he sees his Savior face to face. And we look to that fine day when we will see him again. All weariness gone, clear of mind, strong and sure and smiling again. And the sorrow of this parting gone forever. May God bless Ronald Reagan and the country he loved. Amazing Hyman's amazing grace touches your soul. Today it seems to touch something even deeper.
Father's Day with a complete PC package from Gateway, like our three cent fee. For under 500 bucks, you can get Dad everything you need. It's got the power of an Intel Pentium 4 processor, a big screen for surfing the web, and tons of storage for all his guys' stuff. And right now, our PCs come with free shipping, so you can plug one in on your big day. So call Gateway today and get Dad the PC that offers plenty of bang for the buck and get free shipping.
they help us make the difficult transition from life to death and beyond. That is no different when, when, they're, when they're big, state, formal funerals like the ones we've watched over the last several days. He and then Candy Crowley was in Simi Valley during the service, and Candy joins us now from there. Good evening. It was moving and perfect in so many different ways, wasn't it? I, it, it really was, and so different from what we saw in Washington, the National Cathedral, as lovely as that was, and as beautiful a man-made structure as that is. Uh, it's just nothing for these mountains, and the sunset, and this perfectly clear night. I, I wanted to try and give you an idea of a couple of things you, yeah. our viewers might not have seen while this was, uh, while the camera was elsewhere. One is, it was so quiet here. I, mean, I, I don't think I heard a cough. I don't think I heard uh, a whisper. At, at one point, I, I looked at my producer and said, do you hear that dove? I mean, that's how quiet it was. When the uh, camera started to click, it sounded like thunderbolts. I mean, that, it was, they just really broke the silence. Um, as you may have noticed, the motorcade was very late compared to when it was supposed to be here. It, it arrived some 45 minutes late, I think, uh, partially because they slowed down so that the crowds that were along the way uh, could get a look, good look at the hearse and the, and the funeral procession. And what that meant was that here, uh, these people sat and never, didn't seem to talk to one another, maybe a whisper or so but very quietly, and up above, you kept hearing those F-18s that did the flyby during the funeral itself. Uh, just the lonely F-18s up there. So there were just lots of imagery, uh, beautiful settings. I, I judge probably uh, precisely what uh, Ronald Reagan had in mind when he said, I want to be uh, buried right here, and I want to be facing west. Um, we had, um, uh, the, when the flag draped coffin came and, and they put it up against those kind of sun uh, dappled mountains. It was incredible coloring. Uh, Hollywood could not have done it any better. Uh, it, was, uh, it was an amazing night and I think the most personal of the times we've seen, we heard from the three children. Yeah. It was very clear at the end when you saw Nancy Reagan with the casket and she went over it to it for the last time. You know, it's hard for her to back away from that. Her children came over and uh, whispered in her ear, or we're clearly trying to get her to move back. But that, that took a little while. This really was the last goodbye. Just a, a, a thought. I'm, Mr. Reagan and Mrs. Reagan planned every detail of this and had planned it for a long time. The one thing they couldn't have planned, uh, but that turned out, is that their family, which was often had difficult estrangements over the years, uh, in the last years of his life, and as we all saw today, was very much together, uh, of, of, of good spirit. I thought the, the children particularly were uh, quite lovely in the things they had to say, in their grace and in their humor and in their obvious love for their father. It was a, it's been a long road for the family to get to this point, but in the most important moment, they were there. Yes, and, and uh, the family itself attributes this to the disease, Alzheimer's, as, as awful as that was, it has a way of bringing life into perspective. And what seems so important, obviously, when you're faced with that kind of a debilitating disease, time has run out. And uh, they say this is when the children and their father uh, found some peace with one another uh, when that started. And certainly that was evident tonight, very gracious. Uh, children of Ronald Reagan. Uh, they seem to have learned uh, a lot from him. Candy, thank you very much. It was, uh, I think for people who watched it, it was uh, everything you wanted it to be uh, and, and, uh, and wonderfully played out, if you will, quietly and with great dignity. Thank you for your work tonight, Candy Crowley in California. In the last 48 hours, we've seen this remarkable, and for Americans at least, unusual public image play out. In the time remaining with us, we'll stop and watch and listen again as some of these moments unfolded. We'll also look a little more at Mr. Reagan's life. He was a letter writer. He wrote hundreds of them, thousands of them, and we'll talk some about that as well. And we'll end it off tonight with a perfect marriage of 
a moment. Ray Charles, who died yesterday, and Ronald Reagan, whose funeral was today, together. This is his day.
begin the preparation of our final respect. We thank you that this world is a better place because he was here. to God, the giver of life, that he will raise him to perfection in the company of the saints. He is himself again, more himself than at any time on this earth. And as the last journey of this faithful pilgrim took him beyond the sunset, and as heaven's morning broke, I like to think, in the words of Bunyan, that all the trumpets sounded on the other side. As his vice president for eight years, I learned more from Ronald Reagan than from anyone I encountered in all my years of public life. I learned kindness. We all did. I also learned courage. The nation did. It has been 10 years since he said his own farewell, yet it is still very sad and hard to let him go. When the sun sets tonight off the coast of California, and we lay to rest our 40th president, a great American story will close. to the American people, Dad wrote, I now begin the journey that will lead me into the sunset of my life. And this evening, he has arrived. The photographs of the Associated Press and the elegant work of Newsnight producer Amanda Townsend Next on is not how Mrs. Reagan honored his life and his death at sunset in California, around the world. This is his thing. Everybody knows one. The guru of the game. 
That's why the Home Depot has the Skybox vending machine by Maytag to keep every fan's favorite drinks closer and colder than ever. We have one ready for you. Just call, click, or visit your local Home Depot store today for your very own personal beverage vendor. Then start keeping up to 64 cans or 32 bottles of your favorite beverages close to the action. Customize the logo panels with your favorite team. Set the lockout to say hands off, buddy. Get a two-minute warning before drinks run out. Order the Skybase that holds snacks, too, because man does not live by carbonated beverages alone. The Home Depot has your Skybox vending machine by Maytag for only $4.99. Order right now and you'll get a free $50 Home Depot gift card by mail-in rebate. So call, click, or visit your local Home Depot store today. We have one ready for you. The Home Depot. You can do it. We can help. The perfect gift for a grad who's made the grade? A Dell PC. Give your grad a PC that was rated A plus for service and reliability. Like this Dimension desktop with the power and performance of an Intel Pentium 4 processor. It's just $4.99 at the mail-in rebate. Plus the free two-day shipping and a free CD burner upgrade. No for started $7.99. But hurry, these offers in June 16th. And they're only a click or call away. Easy as Dell. Dell PCs with Intel Pentium 4 processor. <laughs> Want your perfect PC with award-winning service and support? Then you want Dell. Call and go online now and get this Dimension desktop with an Intel Pentium 4 processor and three years at home service with a $6.99 mail-in rebate. This system also includes an all-in-one printer, plus a free two-day shipping. For rock-solid 24-7 service and support, you're getting a Dell. This offer ends June 16th, and it's only a click and call away. Easy as Dell. Dell PCs with Intel Pentium 4 processor. <laughs> For Ronald Reagan's family, today began with high pageantry and ended on a California hilltop where days ago nearly 100,000 people had come to pay their respects. There were no crowds today, just invited guests. President Reagan had come home for the last time, and it was time for the private goodbyes. <laughs> to shining sea, to this soil which he loved so much, and where his body will remain. He sent me a letter about marriage, and how important it was to be faithful to the woman you love. With a P.S., you'll never get in trouble if you say I love you at least once a day. And I'm sure he told Nancy. Every day, I love you. At his last moment, when he opened his eyes, eyes that had not opened for many, many days, and looked at my mother, he showed us that neither disease nor death can conquer love. Those of us who knew him well will have no trouble imagining his paradise. Golden fields will spread beneath the blue dome of a western sky. Live oaks will shadow the rolling hillsides and someplace flowing from years long past a river will wind towards the sea across those fields he will ride a gray mare he calls nancy d they will sail over jumps he has built with his own hands he will let the river carry him over the shining stones he will rest in the shade of the trees. Our cares are no longer his. We meet him now only in memory, but we will join him soon enough, all of us, when we are home, when we are free.
the California chapter of today's story, Mrs. Reagan, who is um, 82, perhaps 83, um, obviously showing the strain of a long and difficult week, a week she planned meticulously down to the very last note of the very last song. When we come back, we'll talk history and the president, the 40th president. A quick break here first from New York. This is the time. of great presidents that they are leaders of 